morning, everyone. I have the top of the hour. We've got a jam-packed agenda today, so let's go ahead and get started. My name is Deborah Shelton. I'm the Executive Director of the acp &P Research Foundation, and it's my privilege to welcome you to this year's Appendix Cancer PMP Research Foundation Multi-Regional Symposium. We are proud to announce that we have more than 400 attendees this year, including physicians, other healthcare professionals, patients, caregivers, and their families and friends, all joining us from around the world. On behalf of acp &P, I would like to express our immense gratitude to our esteemed planning committee and moderators, Drs. Levine, Lambert, and Taraga, and all of our many presenters for sharing with all of us their time, their expertise, and valuable insights about appendix cancer and PMP so that we can all continue to learn and keep current. I would also like to extend my and my colleagues' heartfelt gratitude to the patients and their loved ones for joining us today. You all motivate us each and every day to keep pushing, to raise awareness, to educate, and to support and fund research with the hope of one day finding a cure for appendix cancer. And with that, um, no further delay, I really want to uh, take my privilege and pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Edward Levine. Dr. Levine will be the moderator of today's part one general session, Education in Fundamentals. Dr. Levine is professor of surgery and chief of the surgical oncology service at Wake Forest University. He joined the faculty at Wake Forest in 1998 after being a faculty member at LSU New Orleans for six years, oh, eight years, no, six years. He is the founding director of the Surgical Oncology Clinic, chair of the Hospital Cancer Committee, site PI for the NRG and director of cancer surgery for the Cancer Center at Wake Forest University. He has had grant funding since 1994, published over 400 scientific articles, book chapters, and a book, Intraperitoneal Cancer Therapy, Principles and Practice. Dr. Levine has a research focus on peritoneal metastasis and is the leader of the Wake Forest University Program of Cytoreductive Surgery and Hyperthermic Intraperitoneal Chemotherapy, or HIPEC for peritoneal metastasis. It's one of the most experienced centers worldwide. We're really pleased to have him today shepherd us through Dr. Levine. Thank you for that kind introduction. And I'd like to welcome everyone to the symposium for 2023. We've had several of these before, and it's been my privilege to participate. Uh, everyone needs to know they are most welcome. Uh, there are several aspects to what we're doing. Uh, this is who I am. Uh, let's see if we can get started to, this is what I call the, the 101 class. We're gonna break today's sessions into several parts. The first one is the, fun, uh, the fundamentals. Uh, that will be my talk and several afterwards. After that, we'll have a state of the science talk that will be led by Dr. Lambert. After that, we'll have the ACPMP Research Grant Awards and discussions afterwards. They'll be read, led by Dr. Taraga. And for dessert, after these main sessions, there'll be some regional programs. You're welcome to join whichever regional program you would like uh, when the time comes. Now, appendiceal cancers are rare lesions. And I think one of the things I'd like to put out at the very outset to all the attendees is that you are not alone. Most people who come to see me, I've never met or even heard of cancer of the appendix before. I rarely met anyone today uh, who, who has had it, but now you're amongst friends and other people who have experienced the same sort of things that you have. Uh, this is practically a one in a million diagnosis. Um, and I think it's great to have an opportunity to at least virtually meet other patients who are going through what you are. Now, appendiceal cancer is a relatively rare lesion. So if you take a look, now this is, these are numbers for the United States as for this year. So you can compare the 3,500 or so appendiceal cancers in the United States to 238,000 lung cancers, 300,000 breast cancers, et cetera. 
Research dollars are allocated by the National Cancer Institute based on the incidence of the disease. That doesn't mean that it has any impact, any relationship to the impact on individual patients, of course. There's only been a couple of NIH grants. I'm proud to say they're both here. Uh, and we've worked very hard to get them. And a lot of them were supported by the ACPMP. And I'm going to tell you, support cancer research. And ACPMP is an outstanding place to think about that support. Now, let's get focused on appendiceal cancer. And before we talk about that, let's talk about appendectomies. Taking out the appendix is commonly done. Almost everybody knows somebody who's had their appendix removed. You may have had yours removed yourself, whether you have the tumor or not. There's about half a million in the United States, and about 1% of tumor, 1% of appendectomy specimens are going to have some sort of a appendiceal neoplasm or finding in them. The first appendiceal cancer was reported 120 years ago. So this is not a new phenomenon by any stretch of the imagination. Rarely are these lesions known before somebody's taken to the operating room for the appendix. They're usually incidental findings. Appendiceal cancer represents roughly 0.5% of all malignancies of the GI tract, which is a rough approximation to the size of the appendix compared to the rest of the GI tract. Elective appendectomy, we occasionally do when we can find something, but most of the time these are not, that's not the way most patients are going to present. Can we find these with an endoscope? Should we do a endoscopy? This is a paper we did some years ago. And I can summarize by telling you the chance of having a cancer found with an endoscope in our center was 3%. And that's for people who've got known cancers and tumor, which is spread. Occasionally, you see what they call mass effect or something in the cecum, something's pushing on the area around the appendix. But the interesting finding here is that if you are diagnosed with an appendiceal problem, about 40% of the time, if you do a colonoscopic examination, there's going to be other lesions found in the colon. So it's worth getting the rest of your colon screened. Now, for the rest of the talk, uh, I'm giving you the following warning. Uh, for those of you who remember Lost in Space, you, the robot used to say, warning, Will Robinson. Uh, actual images of tumors ahead, so younger and more sensitive viewers might want to just listen if you don't want to see the actual pictures. Let's talk about benign neoplasms of the appendix. There's somewhere in the range of 10,000 per year. The numbers here are actually very difficult to come by. They're more common than their malignant varieties. Most of them, again, are incidental to the appendectomies in which they're found. The benign tumors, adenomas, low-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasms, or lamin for short, or high-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasms for short. Uh, there's a bunch of other benign types. Occasionally, hear the word mucosal thrown around, which is sort of a diagnosis, it's actually just sort of more like an imaging finding most of the time. If you have one of these and you just take out your appendix, that's all you need, provided there's been no perforation and there's nothing else. Uh, people always want to know, is there somebody famous who had one of these? The only person I can find that I, in the literature is Dan Quayle, who you may or may not remember was the vice president in 1995, who had one of these taken out of his appendix while he was vice president. Now, the malignant tumors are sort of a whole different variety. Uh, and carcinoid tumors, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that. Most of what we're going to be talking about today are the adenocarcinomas or the mucinous varieties. There's some rare tumors. I will tell you that if you're not used to looking and reading about appendiceal tumors, for those who are just experiencing this for the first time, particularly if you read older literature, it is confusing. Uh, there are a number of different systems uh, that were described. There's different ways to describe what turn out to be the same tumor over the course of many years. Uh, the good news is coming up, we have a uh, lecture with Professor Carr uh, right after this one, who will take you through more of the pathology, but I have to give you just a little bit more background. Now, the incidence of appendiceal malignant tumors is increasing significantly over the course of the decades. Over the course of the last 40, 50 years, it's probably roughly tripled. Whether this represents an actual change in the biology of the disease and change in how frequently people get appendiceal tumors, or we're just discovering them more frequently, and I think pathologists are more adept at describing them, is unclear. Uh, but in any event, there's no question that we're seeing a lot more of this than was seen in years past. 
People will also talk about something called pseudomyxoma peritonei. And if you're a Latin scholar, you'll know that means false mucin in the abdominal cavity. This is also not a new finding. It was originally described in 1884. It's really a syndrome of mucinous societies or mucin in the abdomen. I know that sounds gross. Mucin uh, is really the lube that helps food move through the human gut. Humans are pretty much completely dependent upon it. If the mucin is in the gut, it's digested, it moves out, there's no problem. If cells that produce mucin get outside of the gut and land in the peritoneal cavity and start producing the mucin, the body has no real ability to uh, digest or absorb it and it tends to accumulate. If it accumulates, you can get what you see in the pictures, which will be, uh, I guess, on the right side of your screen. Uh, and that's what this pseudomyxoma actually looks like if you see it in the operating room. Now, not all the penicillin tumors are going to result in pseudomyxoma. Uh, some do. Actually, most don't. They can be from low-grade or high-grade tumors. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And if you have voluminous pseudomyxoma, untreated, five-year survival rate is in the, only in the 10% range. We don't leave very few, many patients untreated, though. We don't like to see that happen. The thing to remember is removal of the mucin is absolutely positively not curative. The goal is to remove the cells that are producing the mucin, not the mucin. The mucin is a byproduct, not the key. The key to treatment is to remove the tumor. Most of the patients who have untreated disease are going to die of some sort of bowel obstruction. The actual tumor, if you look at it, you hold it in your hand, it's sort of a leathery thing, and it can actually constrict around tumor around the gut and obstruct it. Now, another question people commonly ask, and I've got a couple of papers here, we'll hear more about this later, are these type of tumors that are inheritable generation to generation through various families. And these are two different research trials that came out relatively recently. Uh, the first one is from the Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York. They looked at 237 appendiceal patients, 90 of which had uh, inheritable genes, but uh, about 10% of them had some sort of a mutation. They were probably incidental because that's not far from the baseline population risk of having some of these mutations. We didn't find a clear gene that led to anything, and they recommend that you probably don't need to have whole genotyping or having all of your genes looked at, like we might do for a breast cancer uh, that's got a much higher risk of being familial. But there's another study from Vanderbilt, which looked at 131 patients. Again, the same sort of number, about 11% in this study. 3% had something called Lynch syndrome, which is an inheritable syndrome related to typically colon cancer. Uh, again, probably incidental. And you're going to hear more about this and the data related to genetics. And there's been a fair amount of advances here. Uh, Dr. Alouach is going to be here later in the afternoon and talk to us about the genetics and her research on this. So this is actually coming up and you'll hear more about this later in the day. This is really the only slide or two I've got on carcinoid tumor. Now, carcinoid tumors are cancer-like. They're sort of cancers in slow motion. They're less aggressive than most adenocarcinomas can be. 40% uh, of all of them in the whole body, you can get them throughout the body, arise in the appendix. They do not lead to the pseudomyxoma syndromes. They're frequently associated with second primary tumors. Not this tumor spreading to other places, but second primary tumors elsewhere in the gut. Uh, so they always have to be looked at. These are good candidates for cytoreductive surgery or having all the tumors out, but the HIPEC part is much, much less effective, and I don't think anybody recommends it anymore for these carcinoid tumors. On an up note, there has recently been in the last few years, and actually in the last few months, some improved systemic therapy, which is now available for these carcinoid tumors. Now I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about appendiceal neoplasms and carcinomas. And again, people always ask me, are there any celebrities who had this? Audrey Hepburn, uh, who was a movie star, she unfortunately expired from this uh, close to 30 years ago. Stuart Scott, who was a sportscaster in the U.S., also had this. Uh, these are uh, famous people, and they all love something. You can see sort of a, actually a great quote I really like by Stuart Scott over there. So what to do? And again, this is a mixed crowd who we're talking to at this session. Some are physicians and surgeons, others are patients. So for the surgeons in the group, if you find something unexpectedly in the appendix that looks like a tumor when you're doing an appendectomy, 
take out the appendix if you need to, take a good look around, explore, see what where the tumor is, where the tumor isn't, how much is there, what it is landed on. Try not to open any extra planes. Don't do any extra dissection. Send off the tumor markers when you're done. And then if you're not in an experienced center, refer the patient to somebody who does a lot of this sort of work. Once it's done, you're going to need an expert pathologic opinion. And I cannot emphasize that enough. Unfortunately, when we find these appendiceal tumors, frequently we find metastases when the patients first show up. There is no meaningful screening program. Again, there's about 3,500 cases of appendiceal cancer, adenocarcinoma is the fancy name for that. Uh, they're frequently found ruptured. Again, watch out for second primary tumors, not just metastases. There are some blood tests which can be helpful to determine what the tumor volume is and to help follow the patients through treatment to see if they're responding. And the tumor markers that are commonly used are CEA, carcinoma embryonic antigen, and two CA pro glycoproteins called CA199 and CA125. There's also a potential role for what we call liquid biopsies, sometimes called the Signatera assay. Uh, that's an emerging role. So that's pretty much a research function at this point. Uh, but there, and I can tell you there's a great deal of research which is ongoing. But some blood tests to help follow the patient are good to obtain before you have any really meaningful therapy. The prognosis is crisply related to the histologic grade. The histologic grade is defined by the pathologist who reviews the slides. And again, I cannot emphasize expert review enough. Low-grade disease only spreads to the lymph nodes one time in 30 or less. High-grade, much more frequently. So whether you need to take out lymph nodes with this or not, it's going to depend on if you have a low-grade tumor or a high-grade tumor. If the tumor has not spread anywhere, high-grade tumors typically treated with taking out the right side of the colon, which is what the appendix is attached to. Low-grade tumor, if you can get a negative margin, an appendectomy only is you're frequently cured. Now, what do we do for operative reports? Now, this is a study we did not long ago. So that was my advice to surgeons who might be operating on these on patients who might have this and instantly find that. We looked at back at 490 patients who came to see us with appendiceal cancer and looked back at their appendectomy operative reports. Although 80% met technical requirements for reporting anything, only about half described any even look at the rest of the peritoneum. Complete evaluation was only accomplished in 7% of the cases. And about 15 to 30% of the pathology reports from the original institutions turned out to be incorrect when compared to the resection specimens after being reviewed by an expert pathologist. So sometimes the diagnosis and the approach can change substantially. So it's all important to get yourself to a center that is used to dealing with these sort of problems. Now, the next speaker is Dr. Carr, who will take you through this in gory detail. Suffice it to say, there have been several different pathologic systems in place over the past decades. Uh, I'm not going to go through these in any detail. What you really want to know is what's the grade, low grade or high grade. And WHO is not WHO. That's the World Health Organization. And the fascicle is a specific paper, uh, which our next speaker actually was one of the principal authors of, and he can take you, that's sort of the, uh, the rules of engagement for how to grade these tumors. In a nutshell, low-grade tumors typically grade one, high-grade are called grade three. They're usually graded one to three. And we want to know what's the grade of the primary tumor, and even more importantly, what's the grade of the metastasis and I'll leave the rest of this in details for the next talk. Why is this important? Now, here's a series of curves from three different institutions looking at large numbers of patients. And you can see there's a curve at the top, curves in the middle, curves at the bottom, grade one, grade two, grade three. That's what the G stands for. And you can see there is a substantial difference. Whether you have a low-grade tumor, which is always the higher curve in all of these, so this is your chance of being alive, proportion surviving is how many people are alive five years and beyond after surgery. There's a huge difference in outcome based on the histologic grade. And we want to know how to prognosticate for the patients. 
this is the cornerstone of that prognostication. Now, we've got a whole handful of prognostic criteria that you can use for patients. And we have to look beyond just what you see there, those criteria at the top, those are classically uh, uh, accepted uh, prognostic criteria. We can look at peritoneal metastasis, and this is a study I did about a decade ago, looking at a relatively small number of patients, looking at the genes that are active. What you see on the left is something called a dendrogram, which is a list of different genes. Every one of those tiny little lines is some genes that are active. Comparing colon cancer to appendiceal cancer, they're very different. The curves on the right, the green one at the top is low-grade appendiceal tumor, higher-grade appendiceal tumor is below, and colorectal cancer is actually part of the list. It goes to show you what they're doing, again, what the difference is, and you can predict what the outcomes are based not only on what a pathologist tells you, but what the genetic complement and the mutations that we find. We've looked at the different types of genes, the names of the genes, the most commonly mutated genes in there are called KRAS and GNAS. Most of these tumors have got what we call a low mutational burden, and I'll show you what that is in a minute, and that turns out to be important. So what you see here is a couple of other studies looking at what they call precision medicine, looking at different types of tumors, and what did we learn from large data sets? Here's one of 700 penicillin cancers. There's not as much outcome data here as you would like, but again, the most commonly mutated genes, KRAS and GNAS, and what it shows is what we found in our initial analysis is the mutation profiles of appendiceal tumors are profoundly different from colon cancer. This is another study showing you roughly the same thing from another company doing the same sort of assays. <clears throat> what they're looking for, the numbers at the bottom of MSI or microsatellite instability, only 2% of people have that. That's important. TMB is total mutational burden. That's a low number. Only 2% have that. PDL1. Only 2.8% have that. And when you hear about a lot of the specific therapies we have or the uh, focused immunotherapies, which have been so successful for some tumors, very few appendiceal cancer patients are going to qualify to take that based on these markers. And this is actually a case I got, and this is a report you see here. What do we usually see when we see next generation sequencing? We're trying to figure out if there's a specific mutation we can use for systemic treatment. This is what a patient that I got, and this is what you typically see. Very few actionable mutations. There's not a lot you can do, and that chance of finding something is unusual. The KRAS G12D, there's a new drug which is available for that, but uh, this is unfortunately what we see. We don't usually find the same sort of mutational profile that we can do things with. Now, having said that, there's a study which is now getting ready to be started uh, in Norway uh, by Dr. Flatmark and her group, trying to target the GNAS uh, gene. So this is sort of a new approach to what you're seeing, and you'll be seeing more about what the standard approaches are in a minute. So what do we know? Genetics are here to say appendiceal cancer is definitely not the same as colon cancer. Genomics can help us find molecular targets and could help to find better operative candidates. So getting your gene, the genes in the tumors tested is important. Getting your genes tested to see if you have genes that can be passed on to your children and see if they're at risk for this, less so. So what are the options in terms of treatment? Systemic chemotherapy, immunotherapy, not useful that often. Targeted therapy, not often. Radiation really doesn't work for this. Conventional surgery, cytoreductive surgery, and intraperitoneal therapies. <laughs> Hospice care for people who can't have any of the above. We don't like to see that. Chemotherapy, you'll hear more about that from Dr. Shen later in the morning. From 40,000 feet, the chemotherapy works best for high-grade tumors. Whether it works at all for low-grade tumors is uh, debatable. What do we do? What you'll hear a lot about is cytoreductive surgery, or CRS. And what we have for cytoreductive surgery is you go to the operating room and you do what if you were in the military, you would call a search and destroy mission. Anything that's got tumor on it, we try to take out. Once we get everything cleared out to find to fight some cells that are left behind, we can send some heated or hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy through the peritoneal cavity. And it's got the advantage of substantially increased drug to exposure for the, any cells which are left. This is how we select patients. You have to have a tumor which is resectable, metastasis is resectable, and the patients have to be fit for a major operation. And cardiac, pulmonary, nutritionally, what kind of stats you're in overall, emotionally, and your support, all important. 
Now, how do we get patients ready? Everybody's going to have some sort of bowel prep. If you're going to anticipate a splenectomy, number of consultations, we usually screen uh, for MRSA. We're not screening for COVID anymore, thank goodness. Hopefully that's going to go away. And the goal of the operation is complete set reduction. We want to get everything that you can see or feel cleaned out. Once we get all the gross disease out, the prognosis becomes much better. We keep score of how much tumor is in the abdomen with something called a PCI or perineal cancer index. This is sort of a cumbersome system that was invented about 30 years ago. And the abdomen's broken down actually into 13 zones, four in the small bowel, nine in the abdomen, and each one is scored zero to three. You want to see the lower score is better. Higher scores mean there's higher tumor burden. And again, this is what, oops, sorry about that. This is some of the outcome data that we see based on the resection scores. Oop. My goodness. There we go. So how do we keep, um, slides are frightening me. How do we keep track of that? Well, the PCI score tells you how much tumor is in there, how much tumor is left when you're done. Two ways to keep score. Something called a CC score, completeness of side reduction score. Nothing left. Tiny little lesions, intermediate sized lesions or bulk disease. Very similar to this is the residual tumor score or R score that comes from the uh, AJCC staging manual. Both of these are crisply prognostic. And I'll take you through some of the Wake Forest experience, not because it's unique, uh, but because it's pretty typical of what we've done over our last thousand patients uh, with this disease. So if you look here, you can see the differences in outcomes in terms of score on the left side of the screen. Complete side of reduction, R0, R1, R2A, B, and C. So R2A is low volume disease, and this is survival based on outcomes over the course of more than 10 years. So if you can have a complete side of reduction, your chance of making 10 years is close to 70 to 80%, which is similar to what other centers are able to achieve that are experienced. On the right side of the screen, it's basically it says that if you have nodal positivity, your outcomes are not quite as good. This is something that looks at performance status. The better shape you are when you come to the operation, the more likely you are to do well. By the time patients are having severe symptoms, what we call the ECOG-3, which is the bottom line there, the chance of having a good outcome after these, even these big operations is not great. So you do not want to wait until you have severe symptoms before you intervene. And this study was slide which looks at the learning curve this breaks our experience over 1,000 cases into 200 each. The lowest curve on there was our first 200 cases. And what that tells you, it takes a long time to learn how to do this and do it well. It's not just the experience of the surgeon, it's the experience of the center and all the support team. And this is absolutely a team sport. So what did we learn? These are the prognostic features, histologic grade, PCI, resection score, performance status, nodal status, and in smaller print, but still important, whether you have complications or not after surgery, where is your center on the learning curve, and do you have patient support? Now, what you haven't heard me talk about yet is randomized trial, because there's only a couple of them that are out there. The first one was done by the surgery branch of the National Cancer Institute, and this compared appendiceal low-grade tumors having cytoreductive surgery with or without the HIPEC procedure the study could not be completed because it couldn't get patients to sign up for it. Bear in mind that at the National Cancer Institute, they give the surgery away for free and they'll fly you in and fly you out for free to get it. They still couldn't fill the trial. We did a trial here at Wake Forest. Our study compared mitomycin versus oxaliplatinum in the perfusate. It's the only completed trial for appendiceal cancer uh, looking at neoplastic endpoints that's ever been done to date. Simple study, appendiceal cancer, center of surgeon HIPEC, comparing one drug versus the other for a standard perfusion. Uh, we had 136 patients in the trial from three centers. What we found is the white count is different. So the impact of these two different drugs on your bone marrow is slightly different. Uh, the mitomycin is somewhat more immunosuppressive in terms of holding your white count down. The platelet counts are similar, a little bit different as well. Oxaliplatinum is harder on your platelets. But most importantly, 
this is the long-term outcome. It didn't seem to make a difference here. The study's already been published and presented. I just refreshed this to give 10-year outcome data. I'm not allowed to tell you exactly what it shows because it's been submitted for publication, uh, but I'll wink at you and say that you may not be surprised at what you'll find in terms of outcome because there's nothing going on in these charts in terms of trends. So what did we learn? Again, overall survival for low grade is much better. Better if you have a complete side of reduction. And whether you had oxaliplatinum or mitomycin didn't seem to make a difference in your outcome. Quality of life was somewhat better. And I want to talk to just for a second about quality of life. These curves are two different quality of life parameters. Uh, we've looked at this in several hundred patients who have undergone the procedure. And for the first six to 12 weeks, first three months, quality of life is not where it was. Starting on the left-hand side of the screen is the baseline. Usually it takes some months to get over one of these, somewhere between one and six months to recover, depending on what you have to do when you take things out when you do these operations. In our study, the oxaliplatinum platinum had a slightly better uh, uh, outcome in terms of quality of life for the first six months. After that, it didn't make a difference. The other thing we find is there's some differences in terms of uh, depressive parameters. On the right side is a DESD, which is a marker of depression. And if you look at the curve, the blue line says probable. The initial rate of depressive symptoms when patients come to see us with these advanced tumors was 18%. Once we were done after the procedure, uh, the depression rate went down to 12%. And what that really means is that this is actually a better depressant, antidepressant uh, than Zoloft or Paxil. So quality of life is important. It takes a while to recover. We have to be aware and look for depression in our patients. We also look, did a study looking at the caregivers for the patients who take care of the patients, those who come in with somebody. It's important to have a, a caregiver when you come in for these procedures. And we learned a number of things. I don't have time to go through it all in detail. Uh, but we number one, we ask a lot of our caregivers. And if you're a patient, be nice to your caregivers and buy them good birthday presents every year because we need their support and how they do and what kind of support they can deliver is actually related to how patients are going to do over their long-term outcome. So what are we doing? We've got a whole handful of research, which is ongoing here. You're going to hear a lot about this through the rest of the morning. Uh, a lot of these people are talking about this. You'll hear about these today. And before the sun sets over this talk, in summary, this is a rare disease increasing in incidence, grade and resection, status and completeness of resection is important. It's important to get expertise in terms of surgeon, in terms of pathologists, in terms of teams. Complications rates are significant, but long-term survival is possible for many patients. We're learning a lot in terms of research trials. Clinical trials are possible. We're working hard to do more of them. And the picture you see in the middle is our team. <clears throat> and uh, since we've been doing this, we're now closing in on a third of a century of work in this area. The pictures around the outside are some of our survivors. Thank you to our survivors. Thank you to the ACPMP. Um, and we'll be able to get to some of your questions. Now, I think I ran a few minutes over. So I'm going to go to the, the next slide. My next duty, and I appreciate this one. This is more of a pleasure than a duty as I get to introduce um, our next speaker, who's Dr. Norman Carr. Dr. Carr is a pathologist from uh, England. He was the lead pathologist at the Basingstoke Center, which is probably the most experienced center on the planet currently for total number of cases treated. He is well distinguished to my way of thinking, and this may embarrass him slightly. I think he's the Dean of Pathologists for Appendiceal Cancer. So we have uh, actually a, a internationally known expert He's widely published on these subjects in the literature. He has been the uh, one of the principal authors of the World Health Organization Classification System, participated in the American Joint Commission on Cancer Staging System. And while he retired from practice, I was able to lure him back to give this talk to you today because I know it's important that everyone hears what he has to say. Uh, I, for one, look for his uh, expertise in terms of looking at opinions on how to classify these tumors. He has a spectacular experience. Dr. Carr, we look forward to your talk and thank you for joining us today.
I thought I'd unmuted before. It just shows you must have come on again. My apologies. As I was saying, hopefully you can hear me now. And um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Levine for those very kind words. And it's a great honor and a pleasure to be here. The title of my talk is Pathology, Navigating the Complex Maze. And if you are um, a patient or a relative or a caregiver, this talk is very much aimed at you. It is, um, I have tried to avoid as much technical detail as possible. And so uh, many participants in this symposium may know quite a lot of what I'm going to say already, but um, I don't make any apologies for that because I very much want this to bring everybody taking part in this symposium up to speed. And just to start with on that, um, uh, in that theme, I'm going to tell you a bit about the pathology of PMP dependency on neoplasia and the role of the pathologist as part of the multidisciplinary team and start off perhaps with explaining what is pathology. Pathology is the study of changes in the body due to disease. It is, it investigates disease processes such as inflammation, immunity, and cancer. And autopsies of suspicious deaths are only a small part of pathology. Many of you, when you hear the word pathology or pathologists, will think of someone who you might see on TV um, investigating some fascinating death. Some pathologists do that, but most pathologists do not. I'm just going to get my view sorted out. Okay. Pathologists are qualified medical practitioners. We are all doctors. We've all been to medical school. And we all contribute to patient care. We use the microscope to examine patient specimens to determine important characteristics of whatever disease they may have that may affect their treatment. And some of us are also involved in research. We investigate the structural, molecular, and genetic changes associated with disease. Now, as I'm sure most of you know, the appendix is a small tube in continuity with the large intestine. And there you can see a diagram showing you where it is. Um, the mouth of the appendix opens out into the large intestine and the structure, the anatomy of the appendix it shares many similarities with the rest of the intestine. And um, also, along with the rest of the intestine and the other abdominal organs, it is surrounded by the peritoneal membrane. That membrane lines the inside of the abdomen, it lines all the organs, and that is what lines the peritoneal cavity, and that is, of course, where pseudomyxoma peritonei develops. Some people will tell you the appendix is a vestigial structure. In other words, that it's a sort of a, an evolutionary remnant with no important jobs. This is wrong. It is not vestigial. It has two main functions. Firstly, it's an immune organ like the tonsils and contributes to immunity in the gut. Secondly, it is a sanctuary where good bacteria can live. Um, in, the, in the narrow tube of the appendix, the good bacteria that live in the gut can survive when the, um, when the bacteria elsewhere in the intestine have been um, uh, damaged in some way, for example, if you have diarrhea or dysentery. And then the good bacteria can then recolonize the rest of your uh, intestine when the disease is finished. Now, these are, as I say, these are specific functions of the appendix. Having said that, of course, just like your tonsils and just like many other organs, you can have it removed if it's diseased and um, you won't come to any harm. But it does have these functions. And I mentioned that it can be a site of disease. And of course, um, appendicitis, 
is the most common. There is an appendix of appendicitis. And of course, on rarer uh, occasions, it can also be a site of cancer. That, um, uh, that picture there, I'm trying to get my little pointer to work, see if I can get that to work. Um, no, I can probably, no, I can't get the pointer to work, I don't think. Never mind. Um, the hole in the middle of that appendix is, um, uh, is a rupture. In other words, it's a hole in the appendix due to inflammation. That is an appendix that was removed at operation uh, for acute appendicitis. Now, as we've already heard, and as you uh, will know already, pseudomyxoma peritonei is a type of cancer, and it most commonly arises in the appendix. Um, well over 90% of pseudomyxoma peritonei arises in the appendix. Having said that, on rare occasions, it can arise in other organs. Now, let's think a bit more then about the primary appendiceal neoplasm or tumor. And at this point, I should perhaps remind you that um, doctors in general and pathologists in particular often have different words for the same thing. Neoplasm and tumor essentially mean the same thing. And as we've already heard uh, from Dr. Levine, uh, some of the appendiceal tumors that you can find are the low-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasm or LAM, the high-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasm or HAM, and mucinous adenocarcinoma. And at this point, I'd just like to point out that uh, adenocarcinoma simply means a gland-forming cancer. And you can get adenocarcinomas in many, many other organs, uh, such as the colon, for example, so, you know, the rest of the large intestine. Um, but the the kind of um, adenocarcinoma that you get in the appendix is specific to that organ and is often mucinous. In other words, it makes lots of mucin. Now, the low-grade and the high-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasms are benign, provided they haven't ruptured. The picture there shows a low-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasm that's been uh, cut in half lengthwise. And you can see that there's some mucin spilling out of the top there, and the um, uh, and the tumor itself there is lined with a rather sort of whitish um, lining, and the tissue that you see at the top right that is the uh, normal inside of the colon, and you can see where the appendix has joined onto the colon uh, there, roughly where the mucin is uh, spilling out. Now, all those neoplasms I mentioned, the low grade, the high grade, the mucinous neoplasms, and the mucinous adenocarcinoma, all arise from mucin producing cells that line the appendix. As, um, as we heard a moment ago, um, the mucin um, helps to lubricate the contents of the intestine and helps it to uh, move uh, move smoothly. So the mucin is an important product of um, of some of the cells that line the uh, uh, line the intestine. The picture on the left there that's meant to be a diagram uh, of the appendix itself uh, joining and joining onto the uh, onto the large intestine. Now, if you look at the wall of the appendix at low power, you then see the middle image. That's a, that's a, a histological slide, a microscopic uh, slide. And you will see that on the left-hand side, you've got the pink muscular wall. In the middle, you've got a lot of blue cells. Those are actually the lymphoid cells. Those are the, um, those are the cells that are part of the, uh, the immune function those those lymphoid cells are immune cells that help to uh, uh, have uh, help the appendix in its immune in its, in its function of immunity but the inside is lined by um what we call an epithelium and that epithelium has large numbers of mucin secreting cells in it as you'll see on the next slide 
that's an even higher power view of what you saw on the previous slide. And there is a single mucin secreting epithelial cell of the appendix. And you can see that the, uh, the cell is containing a big blob of mucin uh, ready for secretion. And the nucleus, which is, of course, where the DNA lives, um, is the round, darkly staining um, the oval uh, structure at the bottom. At this point, I should point out that mucin and mucus also mean exactly the same thing. Uh, it's just, again, another example of a word that doctors like to use when, uh, when they want to appear clever, I suppose, aren't they? Now, a neoplasm or tumor starts when mutations in the DNA within the nucleus cause the cell to multiply in an uncontrolled way. And on the right-hand side, you can see a what is, in fact, as it happens, a high-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasm, again, cut in half lengthwise. And on the left-hand side, you can see the lining, the inner lining of that, uh, that tumour, and that is lined by malignant, well, is lined by neoplastic, by tumour epithelial cells. And you can see that, um, I don't know, if, I wish I could have my... I'm going to try this. These here are cells that are dividing. I hope you can see that. Um, normally, the cells in the appendix don't divide that fast, but those cells are all dividing. So the cells are dividing much quicker than they should. And you'll remember from the previous um, uh, from the previous pictures I showed you. Um, that the cells are all very well organized. But look up here, they're all very disorganized now. They're not growing in, a, in, a, in an organized way. And this, and this level of disorganization is characteristic of high-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasm. Oh, unfortunately, the circles, I wonder if I can get rid of them. Well, that's clever. Then I could do that. There we are. Right. Now, if the appendix bursts, in other words, ruptures, the malignant cells can then enter the peritoneal cavity. Now, unless they enter the peritoneal cavity, they will not cause pseudomyxoma peritonei, because pseudomyxoma peritonei is these, these tumor cells growing inside the peritoneal cavity where they continue to produce this mucus. And on the left-hand side, you can see this is an example of um, uh, a, a low-grade pseudomyxoma peritonei. You can see that uh, in the top image, there's a little strip of tumor cells surrounded by all that pale mucin that they've produced. And a slightly higher power view of another case um, in the lower picture. And again, in this is a low-grade case. So you can see how it sort of, it, it looks almost normal, but it's not normal. They are tumor cells. And obviously the right-hand picture is a, is a, a picture showing pseudomyxoma peritonei. We've heard about the significance of grade already. Low grade tends to grow more slowly, high grade, um, grows much faster and often needs to chemotherapy because we know that chemotherapy can have an effect in high grade, whereas it probably doesn't have much of an effect in low grade. And again, this is meant to show you the difference between low grade and high grade under the microscope. This is what, these are the features that pathologists look for when they're trying to uh, judge the grade of a tumor. On the left hand side, the nuclei, the little round uh, darkly staining structures are all fairly even, they're all lined up nicely, and the cells are still producing quite a lot of mucus. On the right hand side, you can see they're all jumbled up. The nuclei are no longer even in size, they're different sizes, they're filling up the, uh, the cells, which are not really making much mucin anymore. Now, how do these tumors develop? Well, they seem to arise from a precursor benign lesion, which is something we uh, call a serrated polyp. There's one on the left. 
There's no known connection with diet or other lifestyle factors, but as the mutations develop, so the um, uh, so the tumor starts to push its way through the wall of the appendix, as you can see there on the right, those, those tongues of tumor are now pushing their way through the wall. And if they burst through it, and if they get, and if those cells are released into the peritoneal cavity, then pseudomyxoma peritonei will result or could result. We've also heard that there are other types of appendiceal neoplasia. Um, I won't say much about those. I will mention the fact that non-mucinous adenocarcinomas of the appendix can occur. These resemble the typical type of colon cancer. There's something called goblet cell adenocarcinoma that you can uh, come across. And the reason I mention those two in particular is they can spread to the peritoneum um, and are therefore often treated with cytoreductive surgery and, and uh, peritoneal chemotherapy, even though they do not cause pseudomyxoma peritonei. Okay, let's move on then to the role of the pathologist in patient care. What my job is, is to examine the specimen removed by the surgeons. And we do this by looking at it, uh, the, the principal way we do it is um, by looking at it under the microscope, that's called histology. And it may also involve genetic analysis. And as we'll hear later, the, um, the significance of genetic analysis is only going to become more and more important as we learn more about the genes that are involved in, uh, in the development of, uh, of this disease. The genes have become mutated to, uh, to produce this disease. So what happens to the specimen after it leaves the operating theater? Well, it's fixed in a solution of formalin and then dissected by a pathologist. And on the left-hand side there, you can see uh, the pathologist on the left who is being assisted by two laboratory scientists. And the pathologist is selecting pieces of tissue, which are then put in little plastic cassettes, as you can see in the middle. Those little pieces of tissue are then um, essentially um, uh, embedded in uh, paraffin wax which is the same sort of wax as you use to make candles. And the reason you do that is so that you can cut very thin sections. You couldn't cut sections that thin if it wasn't, if the tissue wasn't supported in the wax in that way. Incidentally, formalin is just a, a solution of formaldehyde gas in water. And what it does is it, is it preserves the specimen, stops it going off and makes it a bit firmer and easier to dissect. So once the specimen has been embedded in wax, it's then cut on, uh, on a machine called a microtome, you can see on the left, and then it's mounted on a glass slide and stained, as you can see in the middle. That section there is many times thinner than a human hair. So each individual cell uh, can be seen lying flat on the slide. And then I will look at it under the microscope and write a report. And so what are some of the important features of the pathology report in the case of PMP? Well, we've heard of some of them already. Firstly, we need to make sure we know what the primary tumor is. And as we've heard in case of PMP, it's usually from the appendix. We need to know the grade, low or high. Low, as you can see on the uh, left. High grade, as you can see there. We've already discussed that somewhat. Hopefully you're now being starting to be able to recognize the even small, regular, nuclei of a low-grade tumor on the left and the jumbled up, irregular, larger um, nuclei on the right. If signaturing cells are present, that also means the prognosis is worse and the tumor is likely to grow more quickly. And the third picture along shows signaturing cells. They're called signaturing cells because they look like a signaturing with a, with, um, if you use your imagination. And if they are present, then um, that's an important thing that the surgeon will want to know. And we've heard about lymph nodes too. In higher grade tumors, lymph nodes can be involved. And if they're involved, then uh, that may have implications for treatment and prognosis. And as I said, I'm not too sure if you can see my pointer here, but these white dots here are lymph nodes that are infiltrated by uh, by an adenocarcinoma.
So when you think about the clinical team, don't forget the pathologists and lab scientists. Pathology is the scientific basis of medicine, and it contributes to care throughout the patient's journey. And if you have any questions, of course, I'll be happy to address them. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Carr. Appreciate you taking the time to come out and speak with us today. Now we're going to change gears a little bit, and we're going to uh, let me introduce our next speaker, who is John Paul Shen, or JP as I call him. Um, he is a, a physician scientist with a background in chemical biology, training in internal medicine as well as uh, oncology. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Medical Oncology at the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas, where his clinical practice is focused on colon and appendiceal cancers. He's been working for a long time to work on uh, to better understand the genome and leverage that understanding to better delivery of chemotherapy. His immediate research goals are related to the discovery of new synthetic lethal genetic relationships as it uh, can be used to res define response to all to the already FDA approved drugs and to identify new chemotherapeutic drugs and targets. Or frankly, he is an expert in treating appendiceal cancer uh, for with uh, chemotherapy and systemic treatment. Uh, JP, thank you for joining us today. Awesome. Uh, we're very happy to be here. Uh, Dr. Mike, thank you for that uh, introduction and uh, and for the invitation. Um, so, uh, you know, I'll be talking about uh, the chemotherapy landscape, uh, which is, you know, thankfully rapidly changing after really being, uh, you know, stagnant for, for a long time. Um, uh, okay. Um, briefly, um, these are disclosures and um, not sure if it's relevant to describe, but it, we will be talking about off-label use of drugs um, because there are actually no drugs that are approved specifically for appendiceal cancer. And so, you know, every... Every time we give someone chemotherapy for appendiceal cancer, it's off-label, meaning we're using uh, drugs that were developed for a different tumor um, in, in appendiceal cancer. And so hopefully, uh, you know, in the near future, we'll have drugs that were made specifically for appendix cancer. And so, um, you know, I started studying uh, appendiceal cancer um, about six years ago when I was at UC San Diego, and uh, you know, Dr. Levine has kind of already shown, um, you know, just how different appendiceal cancer and colon cancer is. Um, and, you know, given how different these two tumors are, it, it really just bothered me on a personal level that the, the national recommendations uh, from the, the NCCM, which is called the, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, uh, which is essentially like your, um, you know, the, the manual of, of how to be a, a medical oncologist that tells you what chemotherapy you should give uh, for which tumors, uh, you know, has recommended that um, appendix cancer be treated with the exact same chemotherapy as, as colon cancer, which doesn't really make a lot of sense, uh, given, given how different they are. And as you can see, that that was the case all the way up until 2022. Um, and even now, um, well, again, I'll, just to kind of highlight some of the things that, that Dr. Levine has already said, you know, th there's really no reason to think that appendiceal tumors should respond to the same chemotherapy as colon cancer. When we, when we think about this, um, you know, they're next to each other anatomically, as as was shown, but essentially everything else about uh, appendix cancer is different from colon cancer. It goes to different places. Appendiceal cancer goes to the peritoneum, colon cancer most frequently to the liver. Uh, appendiceal cancers have a, have a more indolent, like slower growing natural history. Colon cancer is much more aggressive. Uh, most appendiceal tumors, but not all, are mucinous, whereas, you know, mucin, uh, mucinous histology is quite rare in colon cancer. Um, you know, as, as Dr. Carr just described, there's huge variations in the grade, uh, which is very important in appendiceal cancer, which is not really seen in colon cancer. Uh, at a molecular level, this has also been, been pointed out, but, you know, APC is, is nearly universally mutated in colon cancer, but almost never mutated, less than 10% in appendix cancer. Uh, if you look at the the rest of the genome, like the copy number aberration, uh, it's very, um, colon cancer is very chromosomally unstable, meaning that uh, parts of the genome were deleted or amplified, uh, and that's um, uncommon in appendiceal cancer. Uh, and so really the only two things that are common is that they're anatomically next to each other and they both express this gene called, called CDX2. Uh, and, and that's really not a compelling basis to give them the same chemotherapy. And so now we're, we're on a mission basically 
uh, to to basically break this old dogma that says give appendiceal cancers the same chemotherapy as colon cancer because it it, it works for some people, uh, but not for a lot. And so, you know, in 2023, uh, you know, in the the NCCN guidelines for colon cancer, it's about a 200 page document. There's now, uh, you know, there was just a paragraph on appendiceal cancer. There's now uh, two pages describing some of the differences. Uh, and and we're moving forward to to really create our own guidelines. And I want to highlight um, uh, this effort that's uh, being led by uh, Karen Taraga, who you'll hear from later, uh, but you know, involving many other uh, scientists and clinicians from around the world to basically build um, uh, consensus guidelines for how we we treat uh, appendiceal cancer. A lot of this relates to surgical management, but we're now going to extend this to to really give people guidance on how to uh, pick the best chemotherapy. So, um, you know, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of data um, to help us know what is going to be the best chemotherapy for any one person. Uh, and because of that, um, you know, appendix cancer is relatively rare. Um, we have, you know, being a big referral center at MD Anderson, we, we see a lot of appendiceal cancer patients. And my, my practice is basically 50% appendix, 50% colon. Uh, but in, in the country, there's about 100 colon cancer patients for every one appendix cancer patient. And, you know, because of that, uh, there's not, because there's not been a concentration, people haven't really uh, focused on developing uh, chemotherapy specifically for appendix cancer, and they haven't done very many clinical trials. And so um, I realize that this text is maybe too small for you guys to read, but, you you know, this is kind of summarizing all of the clinical trials that have ever been done. Very nice review from uh, Madeline Strock. Um, uh, all the trials that have ever been done in appendix cell cancer, and you can see that there's only been two randomized control trials. Uh, we've actually done a third one since this was was published. Um, you know, eight prospective, meaning we started the trial, um, you know, knowing that we're doing a, a study, and all the rest of the studies of how chemotherapy works is retrospective, meaning we've looked back in the past at how people did. Uh, which is valuable, but um, there, there can always be bias in, in who gets put in the retrospective cohort. Um, and so, you know, it, it's, um, it, it, it's limited kind of what we know about appendix cancer. Uh, the other big problem with a lot of these studies is, as, as Dr. Carr mentioned, there's really big differences between high-grade tumors and low-grade tumors. And if we put apples and oranges into the same clinical trial, it's really hard to understand what the outcome is because, you know, a low-grade tumor, a person with a low-grade tumor is going to live maybe twice as long as a person with a high-grade tumor. And so if one trial, you know, has a lot of high-grade tumors uh, and one has a lot of low-grade tumors, we're not going to reach the same conclusion about how, how the drugs work. And this, is, this has been a major problem, um, you know, in, in appendix cell cancer. Um, so if, if you remember one thing uh, that I say, it's, you know, colon cancer and appendix cell cancer are not the same. Uh, if you remember a second thing, it's that, you know, one size does not fit all. Um, you know, this idea is being uh, appreciated across all of oncology. Uh, you guys have probably heard of the idea of, you know, personalized medicine or personalized oncology. Uh, you know, we're trying to basically understand you know, for each individual person, what made their cancer, you know, why did their cancer develop, what genes were mutated, what genes are expressed, because if we can understand, uh, you know, how your particular tumor, you know, became a tumor, we'll, we'll know better how to, um, you know, to kill it with chemotherapy. And while, um, you know, there's only a few subtypes uh, under the microscope in terms of like what the the tumor will actually look like, there's many different paths that it could take to get there. And so, you know, depending on whether, you know, GNAS was mutated or GNAS and KRAS are mutated or P53 or, or other genes, BRAP, depending on the, the, the specific genes that are mutated in each tumor uh, will likely determine what, what it was going to be the effect of chemotherapy. And so at this point, we, we know that all of the tumors are different. We're still trying to understand what differences are really important in terms of, you know, are, you know, will this drug work and this drug won't work? Uh, that's, you know, unfortunately still something that we're trying to learn, uh, but we're, we're building the data to, to learn these things. Um, because, you know, it, um, you know, because appendix cancer is so rare, 
low grade and high grade are lumped together. But it, it, if appendix cancer were more common, you you really not even consider them the same disease, just because the you know the molecular um, the molecular differences um, and the histological difference and, and the response to chemotherapy um, is very very different. So. Um, so this was a, a trial that was started at MD Anderson almost nine years ago. It took eight years uh, to complete, um, so to get, um, I think, uh, 18 patients in general. And, you know, we had noticed that there's a lot of patients with low-grade tumors that are getting chemotherapy, and it, it didn't really seem that, that, that it was helping them. Their tumors um, were kind of slow-growing, and they were still slow-going uh, when we gave them this chemo. And so we designed this trial, and we said, okay, look, people are going to get randomized to either start on chemo, and then switch over and the same patients would go on observation or they'd start an observation and then they'd go on chemo and we'd see how much does the tumor grow while they're getting chemo and how much does the tumor grow when they're not getting chemo and compare this and that's going to tell us is, is the chemo really doing anything because we, we thought that you know these tumors are just going to grow slowly and, and we can you know not have to give these people chemotherapy for, for years. And so what we found is that like I, there was not a single patient that had objective response. So objective response means that on a CT scan, the tumor actually got smaller. So uh, we want to see negative numbers, meaning the tumor is getting smaller. And you can see at best we had even, and we had some where the, the tumor grew through the chemotherapy, but we didn't have a single case where uh, the tumor got at least 30% smaller, which is what we call a, a partial response. Um, and when we compared the growth of the tumor during the observation periods versus the growth of the tumor during the on-treatment periods, uh, there was no difference at all. So basically, the, the conclusion here is that, again, this is only for low-grade appendix tumors, that the traditional 5-FU chemotherapy, which is what most patients have been getting, really doesn't do anything at all. And so, um, you know, it doesn't mean to say that there's no chemotherapy that would work for these patients. Um, we've kind of looked retrospectively, and we, we think that arena-tecan, which is part of the, the full theory regimen, um, works better in, in mucinous tumors, which in this case, we filtered for tumors with the GNAS mutation, which, which tend to be uh, low-grade mucinous tumors. And so, um, so you know, while we while we don't think that uh, giving people the colon cancer chemotherapy works, it, it doesn't mean you know don't don't give them any chemotherapy. Uh, it basically means that we we need to kind of start you know broadening what we're we're trying and looking um, looking at other options. Um, one drug that we think is very important that um, is maybe I think underutilized is. Um, drugs that target the vascular endothelial growth factor. So um, the, the most commonly one is Avastin, um, or, or uh, we call it Bevacizumab, the, the chemical name. Um, you can, again, this came out kind of small, but the, the, the best, the highest curve there is the people that who are having the, you know, living the longest, and those are the people that are getting Bevacizum. Uh, so we think that, um, you know, especially in the low-grade tumors, the adding the Bevacizumab is a really important part. Of, of chemotherapy. Um, there, it is important that you have to be cautious that it can sometimes cause a bowel perforation. Um, basically, if there's a full thickness tumor and, and that tumor hasn't been taken out and there's kind of like a, um, you know, the, the start of a small hole that could, um, you know, allow the, the, the insides of the intestine to get out, that, that sometimes happens um, with, with the Avastin. So you have to be kind of careful of that, but, uh, but it definitely seems to change uh, the tumor microenvironment in a way that allows the chemotherapy to work. Um, ah, there. Okay. Um, so this is, um, you know, something that we're very excited about. This this is uh, not published yet, but um, is is getting written up uh, very shortly and will be submitted. Uh, so we, we did a, a study, uh, there's only 16 patients, single arm, uh, so everyone got the, the study drug. So we added the, um, the VEGF drug, Bevacizumab or Avastin with an immune therapy, and we actually got a pretty nice response. So you can see here, so this is what we'd like to see in a waterfall plot where the numbers are negative, meaning the tumors got smaller. Um, to be called a partial response, you have to get below the, the 30 line, but it's a little bit arbitrary. Uh, because, uh, you know, as many people here know that the CT scans that we use to measure tumors don't necessarily pick up uh, peritoneal 
uh, disease very well. And so the, the thing that we, we think is most important is that you know all the patients on trial are still alive um, and that the, the time on treatment um, from when we started treatment to when uh, the tumor started to progress was, was 18 months, so a year and a half, whereas um, this was not randomized, but we kind of identified similar patients. So it's a, we call it a synthetic control cohort where we, we found patients, you know, we matched the grade of the tumors, matched the mutations. So finding the most similar patients from our database, um, we would have expected uh, uh, only three to four months uh, progression-free survival, and we, we achieved 18 months with uh, with the study. So, so we're, we're quite excited about this. Um, sorry, I'm struggling with the directionality here. Um, and this this is kind of showing it again. This is called a swimmer's plot, and you can see that the the you know this is showing you each individual patient. Uh, the patients, the red bars here are the the study dry. You can see that they're 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 staying on study. Uh, longer than they're being uh, on the traditional chemotherapies. I, I, it's not shown here, but the side effect profile is, is very favorable to the traditional chemotherapy. Um, and we saw a response in both, um, you know, well-differentiated, low-grade tumors, moderately differentiated tumors. Uh, in this case, we only had one high-grade tumor uh, on the one patient with a high-grade tumor in the trial. So we can't really say um, what what this will do in, in high-grade tumors, but um you know, across uh, whether the patient's got its front line of therapy or later line of therapy, uh, we saw a response. Um, and, and so we're, we're excited to, to, to potentially try this in, in a larger patient population. Um, another um, another effective therapy that has, has been underutilized is uh, taxanes. Um, so going again, so taxanes have not previously been tried in appendix cancer because they don't work in colon cancer. But um, as, as we've said before, that's not really a good reason to, to think that they wouldn't work in colon cancer. Taxanes work in small bowel cancer, gastric cancer, esophageal cancer. Uh, so really it's colon cancer. That's the exception where, where they don't work. And it's really because of this, this APC mutation. So um, we... Uh, you know, because paclitaxel is an old drug and it's um, easy to, you know, get uh, through insurance, we we ended up just treating a series of, I think this was 12 patients. Um, and these are, you know, all patients who had been, actually the majority of these patients had been treated with many other drugs. Uh, and we, we achieved a 30% response rate. And so, uh, you know, we think that um, either paclitaxel in combination with gemcitabine or Braxane, which is kind of a newer version of paclitaxel, uh, is, is a reasonable treatment option. Um, you know, for for uh, patients, particularly with high grade disease, um, and this just shows you. So, me, so median overall survival of, of eight months um, in, in this cohort. Um, so, related to that, we're we're very excited. Um, you know, the um, you know the, the ideas that we have aren't particularly um, earth shattering, and so. You know, because appendix cancer, you know, spreads to the peritoneum, we thought, you know, what if we put the chemotherapy directly into the peritoneum, you know, kind of like it's done, um, you know, after surgery with HIPEC. And so uh, in this experiment, we made uh, mouse models. We basically took human tumors and put it into the peritoneum of these mice to basically create uh, models where we could test the drug. Um, we put the paclitaxel directly into the, the peritoneal space, and, and, we, and we saw that it has worked very well. Uh, and, and based on this, we're, we've now designed a, a clinical trial. Hopefully, we will uh, enroll our first patient in January 2024, um, where we will place an intraperitoneal catheter and, and give the chemotherapy directly uh, into the peritoneum, which, which hopefully will give us, um, you know, more sustained. Uh, basically, the, the drug should hopefully stay near the tumor for longer, which we think is important. Uh, in terms of killing the tumor, and it should spend less time in the bloodstream, so there should hopefully be less toxicity uh, to the to the other organs, like you know, dropping you the blood counts, causing neuropathy, having hair fall out, because you know, and, and, you know, paclitaxel is kind of a uh, a, a dirty drug in that way. Um, and so I think we're, we're we're coming to the end of time. The, um, another thing that we're very excited about is the idea of using uh, the, a combination of drugs called Bromax. This was developed initially in Australia by Dr. David Morris, um, who I had the pleasure of meeting um, at, at the Soji meeting just a few weeks ago. Uh, this um, has already, they, they've done, a, I believe, two successful phase one trials uh, in Europe, uh, and, and it's shown to be very safe. 
Uh, there is a phase one trial that will start uh, very soon um, in the United States, including Wake Forest. Uh, and there's also, um, you know, been some compassionate use cases. Um, essentially, what this does is it's um, acetylcysteine is a reducing agent and bromelain is like a digestive agent. And it's a way to basically dissolve like the really thick mucus uh, that, that happens in appendix of cancer. And you can see, uh, again, the, the slides came out kind of small. Maybe it's bigger on your screen, but you can see some of the mucinous societies is going away from the, the top left to the middle. Uh, and you can see basically by normally the mucin of societies in appendix cancer is too viscous. You, you try to pull it out with a syringe and it won't come because it's like trying to pull glue. But when you when you dissolve it with this bromelain acetylcysteine, uh, you can actually um, you know remove uh, via suction um, a lot of a lot of the mucin of societies. And, and and when you do that, uh, it seems you actually can get um, you know some of the tumor cells to die. It seems that the tumor cells really need to have that mucin around them uh, in order to survive. And so this is um, this is I think another exciting therapeutic uh, that that's coming. Uh, in particular, we think it'd be beneficial for for low grade patients. And so I think that's it. Uh, oh, so so what uh, another area that um, and this was kind of alluded to um, by by Dr. Levine as well. Um, you know, the most common oncogene in appendix cancer is KRAS, and for a long time, KRAS was undruggable, but, but you know, thanks to, to you know, intrepid chemists, we actually now have drugs uh, that can block the KRAS mutation, and so this is still um, in cells. It's not in, in people yet, but we're, um, you know, but there are, you know, this drug, MRTX1133, is about to start phase one testing. There's a similar molecule from revolution medicine um, that is in phase one testing at MD Anderson and, and some other places as well. And so we were trying to get, um, you know, appendiceal cancer patients on that to, to, to kind of convince um, pharma to, to do a appendiceal cancer specific uh, RAS inhibitor trial. Because you can see that, um, you know, looking at the pie chart there, uh, you know, more than half of all appendiceal cancer patients have KRAS mutation. And then of that, the biggest chunk of that is, is the G12D. And so, um, the, uh, you know, right now, FDA approved, you have KRAS G12C inhibitors, but that's only about, you know, 3% of patients. And so, um, you know, once, if we could get this uh, access to the G12D inhibitor, uh, that, that will, um, you know, potentially benefit a lot, a lot, uh, a much larger group of patients. And so I think this is it. So um, sorry if I went through that quickly, but, uh, you know, I think, you know, we, we don't know a whole lot about what works best. Um, a lot of knowledge is just kind of passed down. And this is the way my intent mentor taught me, and this is the way I do it. Uh, but we're moving away from that by aggregating data and doing a prospective clinical trial. Um, you know, as, as was said before, you know, you know, just like it's very important to go to an expert pathologist that has experience in appendiceal cancer, it's, it's important to go to a place that has experience uh, from the chemotherapy side, and obviously from the surgical side. Um, you know, for high-grade tumors, it's reasonable to start with the, the traditional colon cancer chemotherapy, which would be full FOX or full theory. Uh, but we think that adding the avastin bevacizumab is, is an important part, unless you're worried about a, a, a bowel perforation. Uh, I, I mentioned that the taxanes are another option. Uh, it'd be great to compare those two head-to-head -head at some point. Uh, you know, in the low grade, we, we know basically that the 5-FU, 5-FU single agent and 5-FU combination with doxaliplatin really don't work at all. Um, you know, a reda-tecan could be considered, uh, but really we think that these are tumors are going to best be treated with, uh, with targeted therapy moving forward. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Shen. And well, Dr. Shen will be joining us. The next phase, we're going to be trying something a little different here. Many patients who are diagnosed with uh, any sort of significant tumor are going to wind up having their case presented at a tumor board. Now, most patients really don't understand what goes on at the tumor board. So we've elected to put together what is uh, a tumor board for you today, looking at a couple of patients. So on our tumor board, and tumor boards are composed of usually several uh, physicians, nurses, therapists, et cetera, who are going to be working uh, to come up with treatment plans and better understanding for each individual patient. So on our tumor board today, uh, we're going to have uh, some strong representation 
from the Huntsman Cancer Institute uh, University in, in Utah, Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, Dr. Lambert in surgical oncology. Dr. Carl will be with us. Uh, Dr. Shen will stay with us. Dr. Gilcrease, Patrick Quinn, both from the Huntsman Cancer Institute. Welcome to the tumor board for today. Uh, Dr. Lambert has uh, some prepared some excellent cases for us to get started with. So let me introduce Dr. Laura Lambert, surgical oncologist extraordinaire at the Huntsman. Dr. Lambert, could you have our first case done for the day, please? Yeah, great. Thank you, Dr. Levine, and uh, thank you, everybody. It's it's great to be here. Um, I want to uh, acknowledge all the people uh, that are participating in our tumor board. Um, so uh, as Dr. Levine said, it's uh, tumor boards are a combination of all the different specialties that are involved in helping take care of patients with cancer, uh, including appendiceal cancer patients. So surgical oncologists are there, medical oncologists, the pathologists, and the radiologists. So really brings everybody together, like Dr. Carr was thinking, was talking about, about who's on the team. And um, in addition to Dr. Carr as a pathologist, we also have Dr. Leonard, uh, who's our pathologist here at the at the University of Utah. And she's going to be, she has prepared the slides so that we can review them. Uh, and we'll be showing those. And Dr. Patrick Quinn uh, is a radiologist and she will be, uh, has prepared the images for the cases. So we'll be able to review them. Um, Dr. Gilcrease is uh, one of our medical oncologists. And so we'll have two medical oncologists, two surgical oncologists, two pathologists, and a radiologist. So hopefully this will give you a flavor of what happens at a tumor board uh, when your surgeon, you know, says that, uh, you know, we're going to, or your, whoever says we're going to present your case at our tumor board. And, I, and before I forget, I just want to echo what Dr. Carr was saying about uh, really uh, advocating for yourself and and getting to a high volume expertise center, like Dr. Shen said. And if 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 you get diagnosed with a tumor of, or you know somebody of the appendix or a cancer of the appendix, you know, don't be afraid to ask, you know, should this be presented at a tumor board? And if the person says, we don't have one, or I don't usually go to that, you know, get yourself referred to a medical oncologist who can then uh, take your case to a tumor board and really get the expertise that you that you need. So without further ado, we'd like to start with the first case, uh, which is uh, a very young man uh, who initially presented uh, to medical attention with uh, two, uh, 10 days of vomiting, weight loss, uh, lethargy, so it was really run down, uh, a distended abdomen and abdominal pain. So this was somebody who was otherwise healthy and didn't have any medical problems. And I'm wondering, Dr. Patrick, can, can we see the images from his initial presentation? Oh, I think you're mute. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> Do you see my slides? Yes, yeah, great. Yes, so this is the first case. The, when the patient presented? Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. What we saw in CT, this was February 17th, uh, 2020. And these are two axial images. So it's cut uh, through the body, um, sort of parallel to the floor. And we're cutting through here, the bottom of the kidneys. And here we have the aorta and IVC. And what we're seeing is a large amount of fluid. None of this fluid is normally seen there in that spot. So just a very large amount of fluid. You can see the abdomen is very distended. And we're also seeing this nodular um, infiltration of the omentum, something that we call omental cake. So that's the really the salient features on this image. We went down further to look at the appendiceal region, and this this is sort of globular area that we don't know if there's if that's decompressed small bowel or what the appendix really looks like. We couldn't see a definitive appendix at that time. Right. Now we get to the coronal image, which would be parallel to the to the wall. Um, we're seeing this is the front of the liver, this is the heart, and again, we're seeing this, this a very, very large amount of fluid and that omental uh, infiltration. And uh, and do you agree that the bowel looked uh, dilated and uh, probably obstructed? Yeah, there was some slight dilatation. I mean, it wasn't a high-grade small bowel obstruction, but yes, there was some fluid in the bowel uh, with some air fluid levels. Um, Absolutely, there was an element of that, although it was not a high grade obstruction. It was not super distended, but there's definitely abnormal bowel with fluid in it. Oh, great. So this was his initial presentation. And because of the vomiting and, and the concern for a bowel obstruction, he actually, and also uh, obviously something probably related to a cancer, 
He underwent um, an exploratory laparotomy, which is a surgery to open up the abdomen and look around and explore and see what's going on. At the time of surgery, uh, the, the fluid was removed. Uh, the, um, and then there were biopsies taken because the surgeons did see cancer. And I'm wondering, Dr. Uh, Leonard, can you show us the, do you have the original slides from that? Yes, I do. Can you see my slide? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is a biopsy uh, from that procedure. This was called omentum. So like we saw in imaging, there was the omental caking. This is what it looks like on the slide. You got a little bit of an introduction to histology a little bit ago, but what we see, this should look like um, kind of just fatty tissue. That's what the omentum is, but here we don't really see that at all. It's replaced by all of this kind of clearish material, almost bubbly looking, that is the mucin. And then within the mucin, we have a lot of cells that are kind of standing out more purple looking. And if we go to higher power, we see that they look like those signet ring cells that Dr. Carr described and showed us the picture of. So this means, uh, since there are signet ring cells, it means it's a high grade um, process. So it's pretty high risk and usually so we, this is not the primary cancer, so it's hard for us to give a specific diagnosis of adenocarcinoma based on this, but this is most likely uh, associated with an adenocarcinoma somewhere in the body, most likely the appendix because of these signet ring cells, the amount of mucin, and the amount of cells that are floating in the mucin. Great, thank you. Dr. Carr, I know you're just probably seeing these for the first time, but any additional comments based on what you're hearing? Uh, no, no, I would agree with that diagnosis. Um, everything that, and what I would say is that if we, we heard about the WHO, the World Health Organization classification earlier, this would be grade three in that, in that terminology. And that's the highest grade of, uh, of tumor in the WHO classification, which goes one, two, three. Okay, great. So now usually at a tumor board, um, after we've seen the imaging and heard a little bit about the presentation and reviewed the pathology, we would ask the surgeons and the medical oncologists to weigh in. So maybe Dr. Levine, Dr. Shen, Dr. Gilcrease, um, uh, Dr. Dr. Levine, is this somebody that you would think about side reduction in HIPEC on uh, right away? We're presuming this is from the appendix. Well, this is somebody who's got a high-grade bowel obstruction and is a very young patient, so they're going to need palliation for that. So I would certainly be entertaining an operation. One of the findings uh, that Dr. Patrick can put out is that when you look at the small bowel, it's sort of held together a little bit. And that usually implies, not always, usually implies there's a fair amount of disease on the small bowel, and that can be very difficult to clear. Uh, so I think I'd certainly prepare this patient for an aggressive procedure, including up to side reduction and high pack, if you can get enough of the disease cleared out. If you have a lot of disease that cannot be safely removed at the time of surgery, of course, running the high pack around has uh, less value in general. But for somebody who's got voluminous societies like this, it's not unreasonable because there's some utility in just running the chemo around to cutting the risk of just the ascites component. Uh, but this is a young person uh, with a very serious situation a high-grade tumor, which is always worrisome, and substantial clinical burden in terms of symptoms. I think I failed to mention at the time of surgery, he did get a loop ileostomy, so his bowel obstruction was um, was addressed, at least palliated, right? So um, to Dr. Gilcrease, Dr. Shen, your thoughts, signet ring cell, appendiceal cancer, what do you typically recommend? Yeah, I'll go ahead and start. Yeah, so, you know, I think, I think one of the difficult things here uh, is if you have a hammer, the whole world is a nail, right? So you, you, you have, we have different tools here and what tool is gonna to give this very young man uh, the most benefit. And, and so in the acute setting, you have this very symptomatic patient, but you also wanna look at the, the long course in someone who's so young. And, and you know, to, 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 with what we saw in the pathology, as Dr. Carr mentioned, this is a WHO grade three, this is a very high grade tumor which to contrast with a low-grade tumor, 
uh, does respond better to chemotherapy. And so my view, you know, we have a lot of patients with colon cancer or sometimes with esophageal cancer where that tumor has obstructed mm -hmm. or is close to obstructing that part of the intestine or, or esophagus. And uh, you, you can see rapid uh, improvement in symptoms if you have a response. With Fulfox or Fulfury that was just mentioned, those response rates and something that's high grade are, do start to get close to 50%. And so I think the question is, you know, for, for me, my, my usual, the, the conversation that Dr. Lambert and I will have is, do we, do we favor an upfront surgery? It sounds like he's already been palliated. So th some of the bowel is brought out so he doesn't uh, completely obstruct. And I think the question is, what is the timing of the chemotherapy? But I would favor a 5-FU-based doublet, either full Fox or full Fury, again, with response rates that start to, to get up to 50%. And you contrast that with a low-grade tumor where they're in the 10 to 20% range. Okay. Dr. Shen, any additional comments? Would you guys normally uh, treat no. upfront with chemo for a signet ring cell? Yeah, we would, um, you know, generally, um, you know, the even if, you know, looking at the scans, it looks like there's a lot of disease. So I don't know. I mean, obviously, until you actually uh, do a diagnostic lab and stage, you won't know if you'll be able to get a complete resection, but it, it looked like a lot. Um, we would, you know, the, the, the chance that a signet ring cell tumor like this relapses after surgery without chemo is, is high, right? So this person is going to need chemotherapy. Uh, so I would agree that. So, you know, the immediate thing was getting him diverted and that's happened. So, the, so he no longer has a bowel obstruction, but now that that's done, you know, at MDS, we would give you the chemotherapy that you need first, just because, you know, during the surgery, you know, with high pec, like the, you know, you don't know how long the recovery is going to be. It's a young person, so his recovery can only be faster. But a lot, a lot of things can happen. Um, you know, after uh, a major cytoreductive surgery, that you're not going to be able to get the chemotherapy afterwards. So, to me, I think it kind of makes the most sense to give the chemotherapy up front. Um, you know, provided that you know the the, the bowel is not obstructed, and then. Um, you know, then then sudden reduction and then high pec and then ideally if, if the person's in an NED state, then we would we would uh, observe them. So we would we would tend to go total new adjuvant and give them all the chemo they think they need up front. Um, you know what? It, it, unfortunately, it's kind of whether it's full fox full theory. Um, it, there's just really not a lot of data. We would I probably start full fox uh, with signet ring, but you know, kind of see like we, we like to watch the tumor markers. So basically, if if we're not seeing that is working, um, we would we would switch relatively quickly to the to the full theory. And um, depending on on how concerned we were about um perforation, you know, adding the bev could could, could also be good. So um he actually did end up uh, starting chemotherapy. He started with full fox and then actually switched to full fox eerie, which is another possibility when we're trying to be really aggressive. So I think you know his age played a role in that very fit person. Uh, and we did out of Aston. So he received all of that. And he had um, about 10 cycles. And then we had some more imaging. Dr. Patrick, can you show that, please? Yes. So move forward to 51420. And at that point, we can see a normal, more normal appearance of the bowel. So um, the bowel is decompressed. You don't see the fluid in it. There is some oral contrast on board here, which we didn't have on the prior study. So that's why this bowel is white, but you see that this bowel is completely decompressed and there's no longer fluid or distension of the bowel. There was, however, this abnormal area. This typically should be either fat or not exist at all. And this is just infiltrative, uniform infiltrative changes really throughout the omentum. This is this study on coronal images again. And here we see again, just this sort of amorphous infiltration kind of surrounding the colon um, and just extra soft tissue, but it's not, not particularly nodular like it was on the prior study. So this, we were wondering, is this um, recurrent disease um, or what is this abnormal area? Okay. Um, so now at this point, um, Dr. Levine, uh, he's received a fair bit of chemotherapy. He's tolerated really well. He's actually doing well. He's gained some weight. You can see um, uh, on the scans there. Uh, so maintaining his nutrition and he and his family are wondering if there's a role for surgery at this point. 
frankly, after a good response to chemotherapy, I would be heartened that I think he's going to be a good candidate for it. At the age of 17, I think you're certainly going to be maximally aggressive and otherwise healthy 17-year-old. Mm -hmm. So at this point, I would certainly be preparing him for a cell reduction in HIPEC. If you're fortunate and you can get everything cleared out, you might even consider closing a stoma if things look good when we get there. Would you consider a diagnostic laparoscopy first, and how do you how do you employ that? Uh, the truth is, again, a 17 year old, it's going to be hard to hold me back from wanting to do a big operation on this guy. Um, so, but as diagnostic laparoscopy, if you want to see if the patient's completely unresectable, this would be the time to do it. So, a laparoscopic exploration is basically a look see through a few small incisions uh, and putting some scopes in to see if the bowel is mobile, to see if you really have a good chance of completing cytoreduction. reduction. If you, can, if you can't get a really complete cytoreduction, reduction, your benefit to the patient is limited to non-existent. So you have to be able to get the vast majority of the tumor out, and the laparoscopy can help you with that. One of the things that I might put Dr. Patrick in on the spot a little bit here is being able to predict exactly how much of this is in the omentum and how much of it's on the small bowel uh, we've always, most centers find it very challenging uh, to be able to predict exactly what the peritoneal surface volume is going to be when you get there. And we look to our radiologists to help us out in terms of predicting things. If there's any question, a lapar laparoscopic uh, approach is fine. Frankly, in a 17 year old with a good response to chemotherapy, it would take a lot to hold me back. <laughs> I agree. Dr. Patrick, when it, the challenge of reading those areas, the small bowel, small bowel mesentery, we know it's hard. <laughs> very, very hard. And it's, it's it's surprising and humbling sometimes that we call no disease. And then you go in and you say, yeah, there's all deposits all over the small bowel and up in the mesentery. And yeah. we just don't feel good about ourselves. So it's very, very hard because um, the interface, first of all, often small bowel is up against other portions of small bowel especially someone like this, this has, he, he doesn't have that much fat by, by our standards. And so with, with, especially people who don't have a lot of fat to really give you um, an idea of what's, what's soft tissue and what's fat, it becomes even more difficult. Would I say there's probably some stuff in here? I, I don't see too, too much here in this mesentery. This fat seems fairly clear. These tiny, these could be tiny nodes. There's nothing there that's really, that's really telling me that this to me looks more mental than small bowel, but you may be correcting me. <laughs> be no, no, I agree with you. I think that the, I, I would agree with you. I, I would expect that to be more mental. I think, you know, one of the big challenges, especially with signet ring cell is that unlike other, um, the lower grade tumors, it doesn't tend to grow as much as nodules. We're seeing a mental thickening, but a lot of times when we get in there, what we see is it's growing more like a plaque or a coat of paint on the surface. It's more two-dimensional and three-dimensional, which makes it impossible really to see it on, on imaging other than some thickening of like the lining of the abdominal cavity. So um, so again, so, so yeah, sharing Dr. Levine's concerns about, um, you know, and you know, just emphasizing what he's talked about needing to get a complete set of reduction and the difficulty of reading the small bowel and small bowel mesentery we routinely do use diagnostic laparoscopy, uh, and I did do that for for this person, and and we did some biopsies, and you could tell there had been a significant uh, response. It was very encouraging, and I don't know, uh, Dr. Leonard, do you have those biopsies? Um, the next case I have is the resection specimen. Is that what oh, you're looking for? No, no. Or... So, uh, but we'll get to that. So, okay. Um, so, with the biopsies from uh, the diagnostic laparoscopy, did show a significant treatment effect. So, that is something that the pathologist can often see that the chemotherapy has been affected uh, on the cells, and also that actually there was just residual acellular mucin. So, it seemed like the higher grade cells, the signet ring cells, really did respond to the chemotherapy. So at that point, we did decide to go and uh, do uh, a complete cytoreduction uh, or a cytoreduction and HIPEC, and he was able to achieve a complete cytoreduction and HIPEC, uh, recovered well from that. And I think we have the, the final pathology and then some follow-up imaging just to show uh, how things look now. You want me to show these ones first or should I wait? Uh, why don't we see the pathology? Okay. Let me unshare. Oops. 
All right, I should be sharing again. So um, yeah, so this is the resection specimen. So this is the part of the uh, right colon and the appendix after the treatment. And what we're looking at here is a cross section of the appendix. This is not quite exactly normal, but not cancer of the appendix right here. This is like the center. And then this out here, we do see some mucin. It would be very easy to just say there's acellular mucin and move on, but if you look really closely, it's very hard to see, but we were worried about some cells being in here. So what we can do to help us in these cases is use what we call immunohistochemistry, where we can uh, produce these stains that have molecules that can attach to specific molecules on the surface of uh, specific cell types. So this one is called CDX2. We use it to look for gastrointestinal cells. And there are some very sneaky cells, the brown ones here. So if they have that protein and the stain can bind to it, it can turn a color. So most of them are brown. So here are some tumor cells. But compared to what we saw before with the tons of cells everywhere, these are very, very few. So this showed that the treatment really did a lot. And this, because we have these cells in the wall of the appendix, we can infer that it was an adenocarcinoma most likely, but we don't see the usual features of the invasion of the adenocarcinoma, like if we would have seen the same specimen before the treatment. Uh, one more thing I wanted to show, we talk about lymph node involvement. Here are some lymph nodes. Here's one that's almost entirely replaced by mucin. And then again, it's really hard to see any cells in there, but if we use the stain, we can find a few cells, those brown spots involving this lymph node. So there were a few lymph nodes involved in this case at the time of resection. Great. Any any other comments, Dr. Carr? Uh, the only other thing I'd say is, that especially because this patient is so young, I'd have done a few basic tests for Lynch syndrome on the specimen, um, but uh, uh, with, with the expectation they'd probably be negative, but but I'd still do them. Great. Um, and Dr. Patrickin, can you show the? Next set of scans. So this is the post-operative study from October 29th, 2020. And here we see that all of that um, sort of soft tissue mantle that was interposed between the anterior abdominal wall and the small bowel is now gone, right? So there's none of that in sort of infiltrative stuff. These are totally normal bowel loops decompressed. There is some um, I, uh, oral contrast on board. So the loops are white. Um, but there's really nothing abnormal in, in this area at all. We see the anterior laparotomy scar, which looks good. And this is his coronal image, basically showing us that there's no, we don't see any disease at this time. Great, thank you. Um, so I just, we, we wanted to present this case because I know a lot of times when people first get their diagnosis, you know, the, the there seems to be there's an urgency to get to surgery, right? It makes sense, like we, we need to cut this out. This is that's going to be the most helpful thing. And a lot of times it's difficult to understand why we're not recommending surgery up front, but rather recommending chemotherapy. Um, and I hope that this case illustrates how the the two work together, that um, the chemotherapy. Uh, was effective uh, and allowed us to understand uh, whether the cancer was going to respond to chemotherapy and also made it, I think, more likely that we would get a complete tumor removal at the time of surgery and make the surgery and the heated chemotherapy more effective. Uh, does anybody else want to just comment on that, that approach to the, or our approaches to the higher grade uh, tumors like this? I think I'd add, I want to reinforce what you're saying. I think this really shows the importance of what the tumor board is all about. You've heard a number of expert opinions here, all slightly different. 
And it's really how all the different specialists blend together to come up with a comprehensive plan for the patient. And getting to surgery first is not always the right answer. And for this patient, this is obviously an outstanding approach, and he enjoyed a terrific response to chemotherapy. Great. All right. Any other? If there's no other questions for this one, uh, Dr. Lambert, can we move on to the second case? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So uh, the second case is at the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> so this is a um, a 45 year old uh, man, also another young man. Uh, who actually presented initially with uh, what he thought was an umbilical hernia. So his belly button started protruding. And I know, um, you know, we've all seen uh, cases of that. And so, but when he went to see the surgeon, the surgeon was also concerned that his abdominal uh, girth was increasing as well. And so he got a CT scan. So Dr. Patrick, can we see that? <laughs> Okay, so this is the image from um, 7523. What we're seeing here is the, what's something that looks like multiple liver masses, but as we notice, we go down, the liver masses are actually extrinsic to the liver, so to, we call them subcapsular masses, as well as these masses in the vicinity of the spleen. Um, just like on the prior study, we're seeing material here that shouldn't be here, um, a mixture of fluid and nodules that infiltrate the omentum. So we go down a little bit further, we see again, a significant fluid, this abnormal soft tissue density all around through here is um, again, that omental cake. The one other detail that was not uh, similar in the prior study, first of all, the prior study didn't have these nodules like this, is that these nodules are partially calcified, which means there's hyper dense um, si uh, uh, density in them. We can see again the coronal images, which are really nice for kind of showing us a broad view of the disease, that there's a completely abnormal fluid and masses um, throughout the peritoneal cavity. And as well, you can better appreciate the fact that these uh, liver masses are really uh, impressing on the capsule of the liver or not in the liver itself. Great. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. So, so he had a biopsy um, that was actually not diagnostic, um, but obviously there was a concern for pseudomyxoma, peritoneal, and he was referred uh, for treatment recommendations. So, uh, Dr. Levine, um, your your thoughts on this? Like, what is your impression of uh, the imaging, and how, as a surgeon, are you evaluating that imaging and thinking about uh, next steps? I think you got a couple of things. First thing, I'm going to uh, give a kudos to Dr. Patrick in there. If you just scrolled through that CAT scan quickly, a lot of radiologists are going to call those parenchymal liver metastases, and they're not. And the difference is, I know to patients, what do I mean? If you have tumor, which is on the outside of the liver, it spread there through the peritoneal cavity. If you have tumor, which is in the liver, it got there through the bloodstream. Now, that's pretty unusual for a low-grade appendicillin mucinous neoplasm. And although it sounds like you don't quite have that diagnosis just yet in terms of what, what you've got. So the question then is, is this disease cytoreducible? Can you get it out? You need to know exactly what it is. And so far, if you had a non-diagnostic biopsy, I think it depends on what it shows. If all it showed was mucin, acellular mucin, that's going to be pretty consistent with a low-grade appendicillin mucinous neoplasm with perineal dissemination, that's somebody I'd probably look to take into the operating room. If you're not sure that's what it is, I'd probably start with a laparoscopic exploration uh, so you can get some decent tissue and we can get it in the hands of Dr. Leonard and Dr. Carr to make some sort of an assessment about what we're really facing here. Is this a high-grade tumor like we saw in the previous case, or is this a low-grade tumor, which is probably going to lead us to move forward with surgery up front? Okay. And 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 when technically when so let's let's say the biopsy came back as a low grade, uh, most likely consistent with a lamb and pseudomyxoma. Um, your thoughts about the the imaging? Are there things that you look for specifically on imaging that give you pause even for those types of tumors? Or what what are you looking at specifically? Okay, that, that that's a great question. Unfortunately, it doesn't have a a, a thirty second answer. <laughs> many, many things. Uh, you're looking for the radiologist's impression, number one, but things that I look for, the radiologist may not focus on, 
is again, when you see the small bowel pulled in and stuck all together, that usually implies you've got a lot of disease. Now, most of the time, these low-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasms are going to spare the small bowel extensively. So that not, may not be what you see. Additionally, when you see mucin behind the portal vein or the porta hepatis, that's a pretty good sign you're unlikely to get a complete site of reduction. Uh, there's a number of staging systems which the radiologist or you can use to come up with the estimation of the peritoneal tumor burden or the PCI based on the CT or the CT-based PCI. It is going to give you a rough idea of what you've got. But when you've got voluminous mucin, such as in this case, what's tumor and what's just mucin is very difficult to tell, even for even for experts. You know, so I would be thinking if if you knew what this was, if you knew it was a lamin tumor or a low-grade mucinous neoplasm, I'd be thinking to operate on this guy because even if you can't get a complete side of reduction, uh, as uh, Dr. Shen told you, that his options are pretty limited for low-grade tumors. Uh, so at those, that situation, I'm going to push surgery as far as it can go uh, for, just for palliation. Uh, we may not be thinking about curing the patient, but if you've got high-volume disease, and this is pretty high-volume disease, if you can get the bulk of the tumor down, you may be able to receive some, uh, obtain for the patient some relatively durable palliation. If things are favorable, then you could certainly proceed with a side reduction in high pec in a more aggressive, uh, more aggressive uh, stance. Dr. Shen, uh, do you agree, Dr. Gilcrease? Would either of you um, recommend chemotherapy for a low grade neoplasm or try to do surgery up front? I typically do not give uh, chemotherapy in this setting. I, I think that with the response to contrast it to that last case, mm -hmm. the response rates are so much lower that I don't, I don't, I, I have not seen a, a, a big role for chemotherapy in, in this patient. Yeah, you know, I, I agree. Um, I think um, you know surgery is is really the the the, the gold standard for these low grade patients. And then, I mean, one uh, you know doing the surgery will also get a lot of tissue, which is important. And so um, you know, being because you know, one one of the issues is that um, you know this could be mostly low grade, but if there's a high grade component, uh, you know, it, it, the risk of it coming back um, in a high grade fashion is going to be higher. And so you know, getting um, you know, the surgery uh, should hopefully uh, palliate the, the patient, but also getting that tissue is really important. And, um, it, you know, from molecular diagnostics, um, you know, if you have only like a very mucinous sample, it's very hard to sequence that. And you know, we, we, we work with basically every commercial vendor there is. And, you know, like at least a third of our samples fail because there's just not enough tumor content uh, to get the mutational data or uh, transcriptional data. And so, um, you know, getting the, um, you know, because the traditional chemotherapy, the colon cancer chemo doesn't very work, work very well here. Uh, we think it's important to do the molecular profiling because that um, would potentially open up clinical trial options um, and, and, you know, potential, uh, you know, targeted therapy. But, you know, not, so again, agree 100% that surgery is, is going to be the first option for this person. But, um, you know, if he was, you know, 75 and not a surgical candidate, or, you know, he relapses after he's had already two side reductions, um, you know, knowing kind of what the, knowing the molecular um, data of the tumor can kind of help you uh, pick what, what a, a salvage uh, therapy would be. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So that was, <clears throat> that was the uh, decision here as well. Um, you know, Dr. Levine, as you, as you alluded to, uh, in talking to the patient about surgery, uh, we discussed that, you know, hopefully, you know, plan A is we're going to try to get it all out. We're going to, you know, go for it if it's, and it's going to depend on uh, really when we get in there, uh, how the word I use is sticky. Uh, the tumor is two things and what it would be required to get it all out. And we had a very frank conversation about this could involve removing part or all of the stomach if we were going to try to get it all out, part or all of the colon, and then making sure that you know he that was consistent with his values and and what he wanted to achieve and what what his goals were for the surgery. Uh, short of that, if we just couldn't get it all out, we would do like you said, get as much as we possibly can uh, and try to do it more palliative. Um, the good news is it turned out that um, a lot of it was mucin. And uh, it wasn't particular sticky, so we were able to get it all off the liver and around the, the portal uh, area that you described off of the stomach. Uh, 
um, did have to remove a fair portion of the colon, uh, but was able to spare the entire small bowel. And uh, he did well with the surgery. And Dr. Uh, Leonard, can you show us the final pathology? We'd love to get Dr. Carr's opinion here because this is one of those cases where it's uh, it's challenging, right? <laughs> yeah, so just a little context before I show the slide. So for this, we received 17 specimens and some of those are like little giant buckets of mucin and tissue. So when we're talking about how they're can be mostly low grade, but small parts with high grade features. We do our best to find those, but we can't feasibly look at this entire, all the tissue that's given to us. So we do try to look for areas like if the surgical impression is that there was a stickier area, we will try to sample that more, but we just can't look at all of it. So it's sort of luck of the draw combined with our impression and doing our best to sample uh, representatively. So I'll share now. So we have the appendix here as part of a, a resection of part of the colon with the appendix. We do try to submit the entire appendix in the mass to make sure that at least within that mass we can't identify any higher grade areas. Um, here is, so this is the tip of the appendix. So if you can imagine like the appendix is that kind of worm shape, cut it in half, and then you'll get this section. This part is less involved. We can still see that immune tissue and the normal surface that we see in the colon and the appendix. But if we keep going, then we lose that immune tissue and it's just basically one layer of flat cells up against the muscle of the appendix. And this is what we see with a lamin or the low-grade appendiceal ne mucinous neoplasm. And this is what all of it looks like. It can get a little bit kind of wavy here, but it's still all very low-grade organized and kind of lines the rest of the thing. What we also see is that it's involving the outer surface of the appendix. So this tells us that it's ruptured and it's able to get out into the peritoneum, which we know because we saw all that mucin everywhere. Uh, but this is what it looks like and everything still looks like that one single layer. That's just the cells against the muscle or some kind of, it turns into like fibrotic fibrosis um, tissue. So that's what we had in the appendix. I'll show you an example of the spleen. The spleen is another immune organ. We see a lot of immune tissue here. And then we have all of these, what look almost like cystic spaces with the mucin and the same, let's see, the same surface as we saw in the appendix. So even though it can look like it's taking over the spleen in ways, it's still coming in from the surface and just keeping these round cyst type spaces. And then one more thing I'll show, just because he uh, presented initially with the umbilical mass or protrusion, this specimen is the umbilicus or kind of like the belly button. Here we have skin on the outside, This. The strip here is skin. And then just behind that, we have more of these mucin filled cavities with that same, the same cells. So this explains why he had that protrusion at his belly button and brought him in to find much more than just that. Sort of the tip of the iceberg. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Carr, your thoughts on this. So I think this is one of the really challenging areas, right? Is the grade one, grade two, I think grade three is probably a little bit easier, but maybe between grade one and grade two sometimes, your thoughts on that? Yes, yes, it's a subjective judgment. Um, seeing lots and lots of cases uh, at an expert center is obviously key to being able to make that judgment well. In this case, I agree entirely. This is low grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasm um, with low grade pseudomyxoma peritonei in the WHO classification grade one. Great.
Uh, what what's uh, can you maybe elaborate a little bit um, on what you look for? What would make you say it's grade two? Um, what okay. what types of features? Sure, um, I've showed some examples in my in my pathology mm -hmm. talk. I showed um, lots of uh, cells in, that are dividing, the, the, what we would call mitoses. Um, lots of uh, cells piled up one on top of the other to make sort of pseudo papillary structures. Mm -hmm. um, it's as if the cells can't go in a, they're not going in a flat line anymore. They're, they're climbing up on top of each other. Mm -hmm. um, the nuclei um, in low grade, they're quite regular. They all look quite similar. They all look, um, they can look virtually normal, like in a normal cell. Whereas in high grade, there'll be abnormal shapes, larger sizes, the staining characteristics of the nucleus will be different, so if you call hyperchromasia or, or chemomorphism, um, what else would you see? Uh, you can sometimes see um, little, uh, it's almost it's almost like the cells are making making little little cribriform structures, which are which which make it look a bit like a sieve um, as the cells grow. You actually don't see that so often in appendix cancer as you do in colon cancer. You see that a lot in colon cancer, not so much in appendix cancer. Um, there are some other features, but I would suggest when I if I was going to summarize them. Oh, and the cellularity, the number of cells. If you're looking at pseudomyx peritoneae, often it can be very difficult to find the cells if it's low grade. If it's high grade. You're going to see lots of cells. Great, thank you. It's uh, you know, it's uh, very helpful to have some structure around this. As you know, you you know your your whole career, you've been in, involved with the evolution of, and the various iterations of how we've categorized these tumors. So it's it's helpful to have us all speaking the same language uh, in a tumor board and and to communicate with the patients and uh, obviously to each other across institutions. Absolutely, so, and I couldn't, you know, I, I can't emphasize that enough. Um, you know, unless we're using the same language, we don't know what we, we, we you know, we, it's, it's our patients are just not going to get the treatment they need. Exactly. Yeah. So thank you for, for all your efforts. Thank you, everybody on the tumor board for your time. Uh, and I think that that's uh, a wrap on our side, Dr. Levine. <laughs> All right, thank you. I think we've got a few minutes for some questions that were sent in. So before anybody on the tumor board leaves, we have some questions that were sent in by uh, participants. So I, I, and I will tell that the people on the call that most of the people on the tumor board have not seen these questions. So they're gonna be getting some, uh, I think some wild cards here for the starters. So I've got a list of about 30 of them. I cannot get to all of them. I'll apologize to those I don't get to, but we'll certainly try to get started here. Um, First one is, is there something that can be done to re reduce the ascites production associated with pseudomyxoma? So I, I might throw this out uh, to Dr. Shen. Is there, is, do you have a drug that will stop ascites production in pseudomyxoma? So, um, you know, I mean, we, we think that the ascites is really kind of the body reacting to the inflammatory the cancer is like an inflammatory uh, condition, and um, you know the, the ascites is is probably the the the, the normal tissue responding to that. And so, to the extent that you have a chemotherapy or you know target therapy, you know that that reduces the the tumor burden, that should decrease the the ascites. Just like you mentioned, you know, like the high pack can you know, even if it doesn't um, you know kill all the tumor cells, should decrease the um, ascites. I, we think sometimes the the avastin um, does that as well. Uh, by, by modifying the, the fibroblasts, which are not the tumor cells, but the cells that are kind of uh, around them in, in, in the microenvironment. Um, but, you know, to the extent that the chemo kills the uh, the tumor cells, the, the amount of cytes that, that builds up should go down. All right. Uh, the, and we have a number of questions regarding nutrition. So for the, for the clinicians in the group, uh, Dr. Lambert would, do you recommend any specific diets or anything? Yeah. Because oh. I've, I've got a half a dozen questions here. People are looking for the magic nutritional supplement to keep these tumors from progressing. Have you yeah. found it? I, I, it's, I have not. It's not here in Utah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I wish we had it, right? If, I, if there was something like that, I tell you know, people that ask me those questions, um, you know, if, if we knew what it was, I'd have everybody on it or not on it, right? If there were things that people could avoid. Uh, I, you know, everybody wants to have something that they can do or not do to proactively ch help uh, 
prevent the cancer from coming back or or progressing or or being treated. Uh, I have not, you know, the I, I'm I would tell everybody I'm very open to considering um, alternative therapies. Uh, as long as we're aware of what people are taking. So, if, you know, if they're getting chemotherapy, we're sure that things aren't interacting. I support people in, in, in looking into different things. I advise all things in moderation. Um, I don't think you can completely avoid all sugar, and I don't think you should, uh, you know, because then obviously the body will need to get its, its uh, energy sources from other areas like, you know, protein from muscle and, and stuff like that. So, all things in moderation and balance and I'll tell you as soon as we find the nutritional thing that's going to work, <laughs> I'll be I'll be calling all my patients. <laughs> have you have you found it? <laughs> no, I have not. What I usually tell my patients is, as far as I know, three square meals has not been improved upon for the human machine. <laughs> uh, if you're not getting three square meals, or if you have uh, diet it, it problems with previous bowel resections, you may need some nutritional supplements. Right. Uh, if there was a diet that cured cancer, somebody would have found it a thousand years ago. I'm pretty sure. I wish it was that simple. I, I, I really do. But it, this is a question I know we all get asked very frequently. Yeah. Uh, let me move, let me move yeah. on to another question, and this is uh, more for Dr. Leonard, Dr. Carr. There's a question. Uh, I have a son who was just diagnosed with an appendiceal neuroendocrine tumor. Is, is this commonly confused with the mucinous tumors? Should I get a pathologic second opinion? Well, I would say that um, if it's a straightforward neuroendocrine tumor, which is what used to be called carcinoid tumor, it, I would not expect it to mimic um, a mucinous tumor. Having said that, of course, without seeing the slides, I couldn't I couldn't make a, make a judgment in an individual case. But but they but, but the two kinds of tumor in principle are very different and would not normally be uh, be mimics under the microscope. All right. Um, let's see if we can find uh, the other question here is uh, we've heard a lot about surgery and chemotherapy. We haven't heard anything about radiation treatment. Uh, do you ever recommend radiation treatments for patients with this disease? Dr. Gilcrease, Dr. Chen, Dr. Lambert. You know, rarely, but we have, um, so, you know, radiation is, is a local therapy. Um, and unfortunately, uh, you know, the small intestine is very sensitive to radiation. I think after your bone marrow, the small intestine is like the second most, uh, to, you know, sensitive tissue to radiation. And so, you know, most of the time the tumor is right next to the small bowel. And so you're just not going to be able to give enough radiation to the tumor without giving too much radiation to the small bowel, which can cause um, radiation enteritis, which is which is a terrible, basically, the, if you give the small bowel too much radiation, there's really nothing you can do uh, to fix it later. Um, the, the couple of cases where we've had done it is uh, for patients who were not like good surgical candidates that had symptomatic ovarian metastases. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, the tumor can grow in the ovary, but um, it's contained elsewhere. And if that's painful, um, you know, that that's a couple of times we've, we've done radiation and then the tumors uh, respond in terms of like, you know, pain, pain went down. So we mostly would do it for, for palliation, uh, but not, um, you know, not, not as part of like a, a curing strategy. Yeah, I would echo that. We have used it um, uh, selectively for, you know, when we have tumors that may be growing through the abdominal wall, sometimes at the umbilicus, we see that or in the groin uh, where it's, uh, it's it's really more for palliation than for a, a, a curative intent uh, treatment. And we've actually had some experience here um, using hyperthermia in combination with brachytherapy that seems to be effective for a period of time. So. All right, thank you. The next question relates to imaging actually. So I'm gonna put, uh, the, see if we can get a response from Dr. Patrick. When, um, I've always heard that there's a much greater tumor load than anticipated from the preoperative evaluations. Is anyone specifically studying imaging to see how it matches to what's actually found? And is there a better way to image to have a better idea of what's likely to be encountered by the surgeon when they get there? 
Yeah. So I think in my experience, it really is working closely with the surgeons to see what they're seeing and learning on the spot with them. This is probably one of the most, this is one of the places where I think we struggle the most in, in imaging of tumor uh, disease burden, because as we said, it's often it's really like a, a, a coat of paint on the small bowel, tiny, tiny nodules that are sort of below the resolution of our imaging. Uh, I think just more education on what's there and working closely with the surgeon can really help develop the eye to know what to look for. Um, in terms of imaging, though, MRI does not do a better job in disease, disease assessment, and PET-CT often also does not is not helpful because sometimes these low-grade tumors don't pick up the radio tracer. So I think CT is is our best modality, and uh, I think education is our is our best friend in that in that area. Very good. Thank you. Uh, next question relates to uh, newer treatments in terms of vaccine trials. There's a question about Dr. Flatmark's uh, vaccine trial in Norway, <clears throat> which I think is related to GNAS. Uh, Dr. Shen, this is, I think, more up your alley. Uh, do you have any insights into what's going on there, or do you think it's a good idea? Um, yes, yeah, so, 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 uh, Dr. Flatmark is speaking later um, in the session, I believe. Yes, um, she is. Yep. So third session. Mm -hmm. Um, I think you you know we can get it direct. I mean, so th this was uh presented um at the the, the Soji meeting in uh, in Venice, and so ba basically the um when GNS is mutated, it's it's there's only kind of one one position. It's always R two hundred one C or R two hundred one um H, and so that makes a, a a protein that is foreign. Uh, and so she has designed basically a um, a way to, to basically get the the body to recognize that as, as being foreign. So the the preliminary data looked um, encouraging. Um, so we'll have to kind of wait and see when it gets tested. I think uh, I forget exactly what their timeline was to to get into human testing, but it seems to be moving forward. All right, Dr. thank you, Dr. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, there's a, if I may, there's a question in the, um, in the live Q&A that I think would be really good for uh, Dr. Leonard, Dr. Carr, and Dr. Patrick Lynn, if, if I may. Um, Please do. And the question is about uh, dense tissue uh, calcifications. Uh, when you see calcifications on uh, imaging, does that um, provide any diagnostic information? Uh, and also, I guess, when you see it on, on pathology, how do you what are your thoughts about that calcifications in like the appendix when you have an appendiceal mucosal, but we'll get to the, the use of that term shortly uh, as well. <laughs> Dr. Patrickin, what, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, for us, I don't think it gives us an idea of if it's low grade or high grade, calcifications often come with mucinous processes. So pseudomyxoma will have sometimes some calcifications and it actually will help us kind of make that preoperative diagnosis I don't think it adds anything in terms of um, slam dunk. That's the diagnosis. You don't have to go to surgery. Um, and so I just think it's something that we see. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. That I know of, I don't know if it contributes to prognosis. Not that I've been able to see, um, but somebody else might have some more recent numbers on that. All right, Dr. Dr. there's a bunch of questions here on the BROMAC trial, and I've been involved in that, so I just thought I'd put that out there. When are we going to have it available? And we have questions is when is it coming to the Netherlands? When is it coming to Belgium? When is it coming to Europe? When is it coming to the U.S.? Okay, some of this is already out there. What, what is BROMAC? That's bromelain, which is an enzyme which comes from a pineapple stalk, of all things, and N-acetylcysteine, which is a medication we usually use to help dissolve mucin usually for people who have respiratory problems. They put both of these things together and they're calling it Bromac, which is a combination of the two drugs. This is something that uh, you already saw something, uh, Dr. Shen put some of this into his talk. It's a group that will, it's a treatment which will dissolve some of the mucin to make so it can be removed easier through a, a drainage catheter. And we're looking into uh, whether it actually kills the cancer cells or not. I think there's some soft data there and there's some research, a lot of research yet to be done on it. The trial was held up for years by the American uh, FDA. Uh, from my, my opinion is that the American FDA and the Australian FDA get along just like this. It's <laughs> absolutely frustration. It's difficult to make. They finally got a uniform solution. They've done stability testing. 
And I think they're getting close to moving forward. I spoke to Dr. Morris, who's the principal investigator of this, uh, and the lead study from Australia. And he said they've actually made it through the biggest FDA hurdle. So they're now getting ready to move forward with clinical trials. Uh, I've got a long list of patients. I know we all do. I've got patients who want to participate in this. Now, just to keep everyone in mind, this is not a study which is going to be available to everyone. Everyone does not need bromelain. These are usually for people who have run out of surgical options, run out of chemotherapy options, and have got large pools of mucin that we could potentially dissolve. So the initial study is listed for probably no more than 100 patients over many sites in several countries. <clears throat> That's going to be an expansion on what was already done in Australia, where they showed some efficacy in terms of being able to remove some of this mucinous tumor. My hope is that we'll have something before 24 is out. I'm hoping to have it open before then, uh, but I'm still waiting to get the official green light uh, from the, the FDA and the regulatory authorities uh, to move forward with it. I've treated a couple of patients on a compassionate use protocol, and there's some, definitely some activity there. You can actually dissolve some of this mucin and take out uh, substantial volumes of it, and there's some palliative value there. So I think that's got to do with, with those sort of questions. Um, and I think we are getting near the end of the time. So let me just take a, one more other question here. And I think this is a, a good one. And I'm going to see if I get Dr. Lambert's thoughts on this, which is, are there any therapies which actually work or show promise, such as healing frequencies, mindfulness, meditation, exercises, specific herbs, plants, tinctures tonics or the like <laughs> yeah um <laughs> again kind of coming back to the nutrition category uh nothing that i'm aware of that um uh, that that i know of that that really works well and um uh, but i will say you know one of the things as i've kind of kept my eye on on this literature to see if there is something one thing that and maybe dr shen can comment on this too is that um, I do believe there's some data to support that exercising while getting chemotherapy can actually make the chemotherapy more effective, that people who exercise can still exercise while they're getting chemotherapy, um, that it may make it a little bit more efficacious. And so I do really encourage uh, anybody who likes to exercise, who was exercising before uh, they started uh, chemotherapy to keep doing it as much as they can not only uh, potentially to um, work with, along with the chemotherapy, but also for their sense of well-being and 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 general health as well. So, but that's the only thing that I've come across. Yeah, um, you know, I, I would agree. You know, it's um, it's hard to. I mean, I think everyone is. To, you know, being in a good mental health state is important. I mean, we know that. You know, being you know. Being depressed can have physical manifestations. We know that. I mean, you know, um, you know that it's well known that um, you know clinical depression brings um, you know physical manifestation. And so, you know, if you're in a you know if you're in a negative kind of mental state, it's not surprising that it's going to kind of you know negatively impact your health. And so, um, you know, I don't you know obviously what what it takes for someone to get into that positive mental state is going to be different for each person, but. Um, you know, but I do think that's important, and I, I agree about exercise. Um, you know, as it, a part of that. But the other thing I throw out there is I think there's a great deal of value to be had in terms of having substantial support, mm -hmm. uh, caregivers, and who else works with the patient to help them get to their appointments, to make sure they're taking care of themselves, to make sure any issues are being addressed, and they've got the kind of support at home. Uh, we've actually done the research, and patients do far better if they've got a good support system. Uh, one of the risk factors which didn't make my talk was that if the patient's coming to see me and they're alone at the consultation visit, that is not a good sign. We want to make sure that everybody's got the kind of support you're going to need for a wide variety of issues that are going to arise through treatment uh, and recovery from all the different types of treatment. So on, on behalf of the, your tumor board, thank you. Thanks to everybody on the board for joining us. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate your insights. I hope you've gotten some insights into what a tumor board actually looks like uh, and for the morning. And I'm going to uh, turn over to Deborah Shaw for some announcements and we'll start getting ready for move to phase two. Tremendous. Thank you. Thank you all so much. That was uh, that was a great uh, exercise there and really 
I think all of us enjoyed seeing the kind of interdisciplinary discussions and collaboration and really insightful. We're going to have to do that again. So thank you. And thank you, Dr. Levine, for moderating the whole morning session. Lots of good information. What we're going to do now is um, just take a quick 10 minute uh, stretch break, grab something to eat, put it in the microwave, whatever it is, grab a cup of coffee, do a quick bio break, and we'll come back at 1230. Uh, to pick back up with our next uh, part two, which will be Dr. Laura Lambert moderating State of the Science and Ongoing Developments. You don't want to miss it. We'll see you soon. Thanks. <laughs>